save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity. Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, family. All praises, honor, and glory to the Most High, who sent his Son to be a propitiation for Israel that we receive salvation. Shalom, brother. How you doing, Elisha? How's it going, big bro? Hey, Shabbat Shalom to, my, to brother Bonnie, brother Cleo, brother Najid out there somewhere in the world. Um, Shabbat, Shabbat Shalom to all the brothers and sisters in the chat. You know, this subject is definitely, um, you can say life's work for our team, you know, and uh, I can't wait to really uh, get into it. The second exit is in the 40 year prophecy. You know, um, these prophecies are intertwined. There's a lot of people out there that talk about the second exodus, but they deny the 400 year prophecy and don't understand that the events that lead up to the second exodus are directly correlated with the 400 year prophecy. You know, a lot of people talk about the people who afflict us and harm us and our enemies, but they don't understand these things are directly connected to the 400 year prophecy. And my brothers here, as well as myself, as Sword of the Earth Productions, we built a catalog proving that this information is true through the precepts, through the scripture, through geography, in some cases, archaeology. We've done everything that we need to do. We went above and beyond to prove that the Most High is a, is a, is a Allah Hayim of his word. For those who don't know what Allah Hayim mean, means God. He is a God of his word. He, he is just. 
his word is bond. And the things that he say, they will be. They will come to pass no matter how much you fight against it, no matter how much you argue against it, they come to pass. And what we are dealing with today is a lot of non-belief, but we're also dealing with a lot of brothers and sisters that's looking to learn and understand where we're at today in prophecy, where we're at today concerning the words that the Most High spoke. So what we want to do is we're going to go through two specific videos because these videos have been the lifeblood of sort of the earth. We've been teaching the 400 year prophecy since 2015 and we've learned it and understood it long before then. Right? So what we're going to do is we're going to delve into these two videos because these two videos that we're going to show is going to not only explain the second exodus, but it's going to explain who's been afflicting us. And it's going to show that that end is coming soon. According to the precepts, according to the scriptures, according to the word of the most high. You have anything to add on that brother? No, no, this, um, that's definitely exactly how uh, the information will be disseminated to the people. I did want to address um, what Maria Yakiyada had said about wouldn't this be the third exodus? Well, when the scripture talks about I should turn back to captivity my people the second time, we're talking about the second exodus with the first exodus being, you know, Egypt, I mean, the first exodus being Egypt under the time of Masha after we received the law. And the second, second exodus wouldn't be, you know, I'm assuming that you might be talking about Babylon or uh, the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. We still occupied our land before certain factions of our people were taken into Babylon. So we will be talking prophetically about the captivity we are now looking at the prophecy, the 400 years, and then the slave ships being attached to that because that was the mechanism in place to bring us into captivity, which historically has never been done before in mass to completely rename and relocate the people. So the significance would be the first exodus and our time now representing the second. So we are, we would be looking at the second exodus in that context, not necessarily looking at the Babylonian and the Persian captivities as exodus is when we left those lands. Mm -hmm. if, if, that, if, that, if that answers your question. Yeah. Well, for those who don't know what the word exodus actually means, it means mass departure. All right. Mass departure. Now, um, in, in the book of Jeremiah, I believe it speaks about there being a mass departure that would overshadow the first exodus out of Egypt. And this mass departure that's spoken of in Jeremiah says that this exodus that happened in Egypt was regarded as so great, but the second one, the one that the, what that is to come after, would be so great that Egypt won't be uh, mentioned anymore. So let, let, let me see if I can grab it. I, th I think that's Jeremiah 23, if I'm not mistaken. Jeremiah 23? I believe so. Okay. If I'm not mistaken, I believe it's Jeremiah 23. You know, and, and just while the brother's grabbing it up, you know, there's still some, I'm not going to say it's ambiguity with the camps or with the teams. Like, you know, not to just relegate everybody in the camps, or to regulate everybody into religious factions, but you got a lot of different people out there and they might teach differently on the subject, but we believe, and I believe we've substantiated that there is the second Exodus and that if you apply the precepts in its totality, you will come to the same conclusion. We wasn't in ancient Egypt, 430 years. We wasn't there 215 years. And you got to take all the precepts, into the complete understanding, no different than what we did when we talked about the two witnesses, 
how the two witnesses are the olive trees and the olive branches. These things have to be understood about other precepts as well. You can't just take one part without add, without looking at a precept upon precept. Through thy precepts, I get understanding. So when you read in Deuteronomy 28, 68, you're looking at a precept to Genesis chapter 15, verses 13 to 15. That Those things can't be separated when a person says there was there is no 400 year captivity. And you got to think too, within the last 80 years, a lot of our people have been told 400 years, 400 years, long before we knew to identify these things with the Bible. The Most High spiritually had our people conditioned as of the 20th century to hear the words 400. Black people have been in slavery for 400 years. You go to China, black people have been in slavery for 400 years. You go to India, Europe, everybody has locked in on this 400 years, but nobody prior to we'll say a certain period applied it to the captivity that is spoken to abraham so spiritually these words was disseminated to us long before we knew to attach them to the precepts in the bible when we started talking about lamentations chapter 4 thy iniquity is accomplished uh, when we start attaching them to deuteronomy deuteronomy 28 68 we start attaching them to um genesis chapter 15 long before we knew to do that spiritually these words were uttered to us in the earth then we knew to attach those things to our present situation all right go ahead bro all right so jeremiah 16 and 14 and i'm going to read 23 also because 23 actually gives a little bit more um in this translation but it says in jeremiah 16 and 14 therefore behold the days come saith the most high that it should no more be said the Most High liveth that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Most High liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands whither he hath driven them. And I will bring them again into their land that I gave unto their fathers. Right? Now let's go to Jeremiah 23. And it's 23 and 7. And it says, Therefore, behold, the days come, said the Most High, that they should no more say the Most High live that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Most High liveth with brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country and from all the countries whither I have driven them, and they should dwell in their own land. Now, one of the things that I brought out and you're going to hear me bring it out in this video, is that it says the North Country, right? It says the North Country and from all the countries where I have driven thee. A lot of times people think that because we believe in the 400-year prophecy in the second Exodus, that we're discounting all the Israelites around the world. But what we've explained in the sort of the earth is that this is not what we believe. What we believe is the North Country, which is America, would be the epicenter of the second exodus, meaning it would start from here first and then it would spread throughout all the earth. And that's what we believe. Um, did you want to add anything to that, brother? Right, right. And, and this is the thing, too, is that the tensor should be risen first. And there's a reason for that. And because of our captivity here, and it's a part of Jeremiah where it says he, he led us in the cap for our good. Because us of us being in this this particular, you know, uh, captivity within the tribe of Esau, prophecy allows us to know. Prophecy teaches us who we were going to captivity to. One who's represented by the eagle. And if you go through history, you'll know that uh, the ancient Greeks and the Romans was, you know, they were represented by the Pontiac eagle. And also America is represented by that eagle. And you'll know that that's synonymous with the captivity of the children of Israel. And I'm going to make this, this one point, too. When we think about the captivity in Babylon, if you go to Jeremiah, the 29th chapter, I believe uh, maybe after the 10th um, if I'm not mistaken, he says 70 years shall be accomplished in Babylon. He says 70 years shall be accomplished. And something that we we don't look at often is that when the Most High says 70 years, salvation was triggered no different than a man that goes to prison for 10 or 20 years. Once his 20 years is up, if they don't let him out on that end of sentence date. That man now will put in the habeas corpus to be removed, which habeas corpus means bring the body. Get out of here. 
what was Nehemiah Ezra's understanding of Jeremiah 29? When they dwelled in Babylon, after you go in the book of Nehemiah, I believe the first chapter, and then if you get into the second chapter, he talks about nobody knows what the most I put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Jer Nehemiah literally quotes Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 through 4, I believe, um, brother, if you want to grab that up real quick, it says that the Most High will deliver us from all the places he scattered us. Now, if you don't mind reading those first four verses, brother? Absolutely. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 1. And it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations, whither the Most High, thy Allah hath driven thee, and shall return to the Most High, thy Allah and obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children with all thy heart and with all thy soul, that then the Most High, thy Allah will return, return thy captivity and have compassion upon thee. And I will return and gather thee from all the nations, whither the Most High, thy Allah have scattered thee. If any of thine be driven out unto the utmost parts of heaven, from thence will the Most High, thy Allah gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. Now, right now, there's a such thing as, as a physical captivity and a spiritual captivity. Now, when Nehemiah understood these words after the 70 years was accomplished at Babylon, he said the Most High had delivered them. Now, the Most High didn't beam anybody up to Scotty, nor did heavenly chariots come on in Babylon and give a first-class ticket chariot ride into, into the land. Over the course of some years, our people went and migrated into the land, obviously with the blessing of the king of Persia, and they started to rebuild the temple. But the point is, is that Nehemiah understood after 70 years being accomplished, as is reason, uh, Jeremiah chapter 29, that the Most High had delivered our people. That meant that the spiritual and psychological bars were being released. He understood now it was time to go home. He understood it was deliverance because the Most High's word that does not come back void had said, had, had said 70 years. So automatically, he knew deliverance was there. Automatically, he knew it was time to roll out. The same way after 400 years, our mindset was supposed to turn and look to the land of Jerusalem. After 400 years, we were supposed or we are supposed to look for deliverance the same way Nehemiah understood Deuteronomy, more in the sense that the psychological and spiritual captivity had been lifted that the Most High had placed on us because the Most High told us to dwell there the same way 400 years was up for us. So the way we look at these scriptures, we have to look at them physically and we have to look at them spiritually. And that because the Most High said 400 years, now we have to have the same condition in mind that Nehemiah had, the same condition in mind that Ezra had. And it's only at one point in time that we can look at these things, that Babylonian captivity, and we can look at the time we live in now. And that we won't look at it as if, you know, what has been in the past is not happening again. It actually is happening again according to the same mechanism, the same uh, understanding of scripture that our time now is to say 400 years have been accomplished now we can come out with great substance that's why we're speaking to these things now that's why we're saying be ready now you have to first be ready spiritually and mentally psychologically before you can physically do anything one once a person has a job and they get up for work now the mind is conditioned to wake up Psychologically, you start to prepare yourself long before you ever walk through the doors of your employment. You got to get yourself physically together, psychologically together, and then you get yourself together physically. And then you walk out the door, you go to work. No different than our people now have to psychologically, physically and spiritually be ready to get ourselves together for this 400 years. Because the Most High said 400 years, Genesis 15, 13 to 15 has to be accomplished for us then we will come out with great substance now all the other precepts fall in order brother you want to say anything yeah i want to say that one one thing that you would notice with the brothers here at salt of the earth is this hold on let me, let me put this down one thing that you would notice in the, in the brothers and sisters that's previewed to come into our channel and listen to listening to us you know this already that 
we don't omit any scripture. Everything that we're saying fits chronologically with the whole the whole Bible. All right. We don't admit any scripture because it may not fit this or that. Everything that we're saying, we don't need to take out any prophecy. We don't have to uh, take away anything because it all fits chronologically together. From us being here in captivity and going through the curses to us being freed and going to the wilderness, from us being in the wilderness and receiving the covenant again, from us receiving the covenant to us being uh, uh, transformed when Mashiach returns to the great war, to us going back into the land. All right. Everything that we are speaking fits biblically, chronologically, eschatologically eschatologically as some Christians may, may uh, say it all fits and this is how you know we are telling you the truth because one you can read it for yourself and you can see that there is nothing hindering any other scripture when we speak we can go precept upon precept line upon line their little hair them their little and their little right so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put on a, one of our first videos that we've done concerning the second Exodus, the 400 year prophecy and who would be afflicting us. Because a lot of people don't want to believe that it's Esau, but it is Esau, according to scripture, who would be doing these things to us over here as concerning the 400 years of affliction. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start the video. Um, and before I do, I'm going to, I'm going to let my brother Elisha get some last words in. Um, and I want to, uh, greet everybody that's here too. Um, including our brother Yasin Get. Shalom and blessed brother. Love you, man. Glad to see you here. You know, give me a ring anytime you, you, you want, bro. You know, brother Elisha. I just wanted to address the question of Mary. Uh, uh it says, but it's the four hundred years of the judgment. Then, um, then we leave correct, and 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 that would be correct in the in the context that you have the four hundred years which we are presently at, and then the Most High will start to plague America. Now, it's no different than the plagues that happened in Egypt. Every, after every plague, what did the Egyptians do? The plague was over. The Egyptians went back to their place and they were at peace. They did not recognize the previous plague though the plague is gone and then pharaoh's heart was changed and that's what you're noticing here you don't know already that america is being biblically plagued as we speak and we've we've read from the targums where it talks about over 250 plagues you're witnessing the plagues being placed on america and they will intensify more and more as um as they go on so when mary when you ask about the judgment america is being judge now steadily and progressively you're seeing plagues being placed on this place to the point where it will cripple them to the effect that now we will be brought out with great substance and you're going to notice a trickle effect all over the earth so in that context you got to look at how the egyptians look at no different than when our people had witnessed the most high deliverance from the egyptians and as soon as we got to the wilderness we desired to go back because we had totally forgot just that fast what the most high had done People are what are, are people in this life or what have you done for me type people. They remember in the moment, in the moment of their feeling, in the moment of their affliction, they remember everything as it intensifies, as it touches them in the moment. But the minute that feeling goes away, you no longer remember the things that you had previously been through. And that's what's happening right here. Our people are still asking us about the judgments and the plagues as if the Most High is not plaguing this place now. Because once one plague goes, one storm goes away, one one epidemic pandemic goes away, then all of a sudden you start to feel like you're waiting for the start again. The start has already begun. We're in the midst of what's plaguing this place, not waiting for the plagues to start. So therefore, the plagues represent the judgments and the final plague will ret represent the final judgment. And then we will see our deliverance out of here. And that's still not the day of the Lord, per se, as people may think. Absolutely. But uh, just to, just to also add, sister, you're absolutely right. The, the final judgment will come after the 400 years, according to what's written. So, you know, yeah, absolutely. That's that's that is correct. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start this video. This is a this is a throwback video. 
Um, we're playing this for the benefit of our new subs who may have not seen this information. This information is paramount. So what we're going to do is going to play the first second next to this, going to commentary on it a little bit, and then we're going to play the 400-year prophecy, Troop versus Scoffers, to dispel a lot of things that you may have heard others say. So we're going to get into it now. I'm going to go ahead and mute my mic, and uh, me and the brother Lasha will be in the background. I want all you brothers and sisters to enjoy this. When the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, an horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with their great substance. This notion that black men are to be feared, and black men and black people are scary is hilarious to me because historically speaking white people you guys have been the most dangerous motherfuckers on the planet you wiped out the indians you kidnapped niggas you repressed us for 400 years we brought blacks into this country as slaves we never intended them to be anything other than a slave but they began to grow in number and in power, and eventually they fought their way to some freedom. So we became even more cruel, and to keep our black Americans down, we lynched, but yet they rose. So then we used the welfare system, the criminal justice system to, to keep them down, to contain them, to destroy them, but Yet, they rose and they're rising. Then we built prisons and jails to hold them. Yet, they rose. And so now, we are doing exactly what the Pharaoh did at the end. Sending out a decree. Kill them. Our nation may end up facing exactly what the Egyptians faced it when they refused to let God's people go. So I'm gonna say this to my white fellow Americans, that the bloodshed that is on its way is not on the hands of our fellow black Americans, but is on our hands. We are the ones that are refusing to let God's people go. We are committed to do our very best, not just to go to Washington and talk about justice or else, but what is the or else? Because every time God sent a prophet, in the message of the prophet, there was a threat and a warning. So it is today. America, you don't have a lot of time to play with the lives and the destiny of a people that God has chosen for himself. We are that people. We are the real children of Israel. When I leave you today, the calamities are gonna get stronger because God 
wants America to let us go, not integrate us. Let us go and give us a good send off. Now I have heard the groaning of the Israelites from the Egyptians holding slavery. And I have remembered my promise. Say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord. And I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out from under their bondage. And I will redeem you with stretched out arm, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Book of Genesis chapter 15 verse 12 and when the sun was going down a deep sleep fell upon Abraham and lo a horror of great darkness fell upon him and he said unto Abraham know the surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and they shall serve him and they shall afflict them 400 years and also that nation whom they shall serve while I judge and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. Notice what the Most High said to Abraham, that his seed will be a stranger in a land that is not theirs. Now Abraham knew that land. He knew Egypt. He knew Canaan. His seed didn't know this land. His seed has been afflicted in this land for 400 years. His seed has been afflicted for 400 years, and they have gone through 400 years of slavery of Jim Crow, of pain, of their women being raped, of all inconceivable things, gator bait, shooting of innocent people in the street, shooting of our young men, shooting of all of our old women, just killing them indiscriminately to this day, having their city bombed and destroyed, burgeoning cities like Black Wall Street destroyed at the hands of these wicked nations. But he also said, that they would leave this nation and leave that nation with great substance. That is exactly what is going to happen to the Israelites. They're going to leave this place with great substance. Outside, now this is past the older guy. He was a black male. He put the Bible up to my son's chest. And he was saying, come, the children of Israel. And, um, this is our Exodus. And he kept saying, this is our Exodus. The book of Acts, chapter 7, verse 6. And the Most High spake on this wise, that his seed should sojourn in a strange land, and that they should bring them into bondage, 
and entreat them evil four hundred years. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage, why judge, said the Most High. And after that shall they come forth and serve me in this place. Now, if you look at the comparisons and you understand how the Most High works, he will typically work in decency and in order. And he will also put things line upon line, precept upon precept. The book says at the mouth of two witnesses, let everything be in the Sabbath. The same thing that he was saying in Genesis chapter 15, he was saying yet again in Acts, which is thousands of years apart. Let's look at that for a second. Let's take a look at, at this for a second. He said that nation whom they will serve, meaning that you will be serving this nation, he's going to judge them. But then you're going to come out after you get through, after you finish, you're going to come out of that with a great substance. But take a look at this. He also said in Acts 7 and 6, that they should bring them into bondage. You will be brought into bondage, just like Deuteronomy chapter 28, 68 says, you will be brought into bondage with ships, which is talking about the transatlantic slave trade. But what it also says is that you will be entreated 400 years of evil. Now, have you not gone through 400 years of evil here? Have you not been beaten 400 years, at least 400 years beaten? Still establish a separate nation state. That's not just my goal. That's what God wants. Most of our people don't want it yet. You love your enemy. You want to stay with your enemy. You're in love with his wealth. Oh, I, I understand the fascination, slaves. I understand that. But God has something else for us. America, you have a shelf life, baby. And your time is about to end. And you know it. The politicians know it. The satanic evil uh, principalities know it. And you're about to be brought down. He's about to bring recompense right back to your own head. He's going to bring recompense right to your own face. So America, and you leaders of America, and you world leaders, get ready. Because it's all with you and the most high. Um. The curse of the Pharaohs, but a poor example of what Wake Forest Foundation played. White America, chapter 15 of Genesis, verse 14, is for us. God is going to punish us for how we have enslaved our black brothers and sisters. The Targums of Ankylos. Genesis 15 and 12 account. And when the sun was near to set, a deep sleep was thrown upon Abraham. And behold, four kingdoms arose to enslave his children terror, which is Babylon, darkness, which is Madai, greatness, which is Javan, decline, which is Ferris, which is to fall, and to have no uplifting. And from whence it is to be that the children of Israel will come up. And he said to Abraham, Knowing thou must know that thy sons shall dwell in a land not their own, because thou hast not believed, and they will subjugate and afflict them four hundred years, and also that the people whom they shall serve I would judge with two hundred and fifty plagues, and afterwards they shall go forth into liberty with great riches. Now the last precepts that were read, if you look at it, these precepts came from the Targums of Onkelos. And so when you look at it, it was described as being four kingdoms. Now, if you look at a kingdom, a kingdom is not just one land mass, but it's global takeover. Chapter 17. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. That kingdom is actually running the world. It's not synonymous to one land mass. So when you look at the kingdom that we're now under, it's not just the United States, but you can account the United States, Great Britain, um, all of the whole of Europe, with their satanic, wicked, and evil practices. You can also look at South, Amer South, uh, South Africa. Anywhere where these people are, they are controlled. 
and it's not just a land mass, it's a global supremacy. But he also says something interesting here that actually proves that the 400 years does not account to Egypt. Because you have to also take into account that this is the fourth, it lists the kingdoms in order the Targum does, but this is at the end. Targum says that the place or the kingdom will be judged and hit with 250 plagues. And then afterwards, that the children of Israel will, will, will go forth in liberty with great riches. Now, you have to ask yourself, when they were in Egypt, were they hit with 250 plagues? No, they were only hit with 10. So this world, this current satanic, bastard, lying, evil Roman system is going to get hit with 250 plagues, folks. 250. And guess what? You are actually witnessing them as we speak. You are seeing the 250 plagues as we speak. So you better get your mind right, Israel. You better get your mind right. You better get your life right. And you better start doing things decency and order according to what's written. The Jerusalem Targums of Ankelos, Genesis 15 and 12 account. And when the sun was going to set, a sleep profound and sweet fell upon Abraham. And behold, Abraham saw four kingdoms which should arise to bring his sons into subjection. And terror, the greatness of darkness, fell upon him. Terror, that is Babylon. Darkness, that is Madai. Greatness, that is Greece. Fell, that is Edom. Rome, the fourth kingdom which is to fall and never to rise again forever and ever. Okay, so you notice in the Targums that it mentions again four kingdoms. But what's interesting here is that it mentions the fourth kingdom as Edom being Rome. But the most critical part about this last and fourth kingdom is that this kingdom is the kingdom that is to fall and never to rise again forever and ever. Thus saith the Lord God, because that Edom hath dealt against the house of Judah by taking vengeance, and hath greatly offended and revenged himself upon them, therefore thus saith the Lord God, I will also stretch out mine hand upon Edom, and will cut off man and beast from it. And I will make it desolate from Taman, and they of Dedan shall fall by the sword. And I will lay my vengeance upon Edom by the hand of my people Israel, and they shall do in Edom according to mine anger, and according to my fury, and they shall know my vengeance, saith the Lord God. So now we're going to look at the, at, we're going to look at seven different points from the Genesis and Targum accounts. Point number one, a key critical point is that Israel will serve under which particular kingdoms in the Targums and we are given specific detailed information. Point number two, and this is a very critical point in that Rome would be identified as Edom and they would be identified as the last kingdom. When you think about the last kingdom, again, a kingdom is a world power, a world ruler, not some little faction or some little precinct. It's a world ruler, as we learned that in the past part of the video. Point number three, we find out that the Most High will send plagues to the final kingdom. We also found out in the Targums that there's going to be 250 plagues that hit this particular kingdom. 250 and not 10. Point number four, we do not see Egypt mentioned at all in any of the accounts, whether they be the Targums or whether they line up 
line upon line, precept on precept in the KJV version. Point number five, you find out that Israel will be brought into bondage. You find that in Genesis and you also find it line upon line, precept on precept in the book of Acts. Point number six, we also know that because of unbelief, Israel was carried away into captivity. When it says that you were carried away, that represents Deuteronomy 28, 68, where he says he will send you into bondage or into Egypt again with ships. And we also know that with the different accounts that Egypt and bondage are synonymous with slavery. Point number seven, you also see that Israel is to leave with great substance and riches. That's defined in the Targums. That's also defined in the account that the Most High gave to Abraham. Now, this next point, what we're going to do is we're going to give a breakdown of each of these bullets as they are presented in the Bible. And this will be our source of confirmation. So now we're going to take a look at the kingdoms that Israel will serve under. Notice I say that Israel will serve under these particular kingdoms. And there are four. We're also going to contrast what the Targums say and what the King James Version of the Bible says. First, we're going to read what the, I'm going to give you a commentary on what the Targum said. The Targum tells you what we read earlier in the past precepts that the first one would be terror, terror, that is Babel. The second one would be darkness, that is Midia. Now, those two, the first one, Babel being uh, a term that is used for Babylonian. And darkness, that is Media, Media Persia, greatness, that is Greece, and fail, the last one. Failed, that is Edom or Rome, but you will also notice that there is something missing. These kingdoms are identified in the book of the prophet Daniel, but there's something missing there. Where is Egypt? Is Egypt mentioned in the Targum? Let's contrast that with the King James Version Bible. So if anyone out there teaching that Israel was, was in captivity for 400 years, you're in error, and according to historians, you're not credible. The book of Daniel, chapter 7, verse 3. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. In Daniel 7 and 3, it says four great beasts came up from the sea. They were talking about four specific beasts. The first beast, it says, was like a lion in Daniel 7 and 4. It had eagle's wings. Now, this first beast, we know is identified as as Babylonia, or as the Targum says, terror that is Babylon. Now, if I look at these two contrasts, what's missing? Again, the King James Version Bible doesn't talk about Egypt being served in bondage. So Egypt could not have been a place where they served in terms of being identified as a kingdom that would be ruled over the history. The book of Daniel, chapter 7, verse 5. And behold, another beast, a second, like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it. And they said, Thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. Now let's take a look at the second beast for a moment. The second beast was like unto a bear. Now this particular beast was was going to devour much flesh. This beast is known as the Persian Empire. The Targums identify this particular beast as Medio, Media. And you can, you can say that this is Medio Persia. Now, what's interesting about this beast, and I'm gonna bring in, pick up a topic, Christianity. Christianity and their eschatological view is that this second beast is the, is the Russians which is ridiculous because what Daniel saw is Daniel saw the end to end of the four kings that would be ruling Israel and would be ruling the world. And so how could this be Russia when Daniel saw the end to end and this is the second king? The book of Daniel chapter seven, verse six. After this, I beheld and lo, another like a leopard which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. Now let's look at the third. 
The third kingdom was like, the book of Daniel says, was like a leopard. Now this kingdom is the is the Greeks or the Grecians. That's what Daniel's vision saw, and that's what Daniel saw. He saw the Greeks. The Targums identified this beast as Greece as well. And so the Targums contrasted with the King James Version of the Bible. They lined up hand in hand. Put both your hands together. You can look at the Targums, and you can look at what is said here. And so, again, I'm going to throw Christianity under the bus again. If he saw Greece, why did he see the bear of Russia second? When you saw Greece third, that doesn't line up Christianity. So you could take your lion prophets like um, that liar uh, who, who got all those books out. Um, I can't call the guy Hal Lindsey, that liar. You can call out any other liar that, that, that thinks they know prophecy, which they should be teaching prophecy. They've never been given no prophecy. If they read line upon line precept, upon precept, you would know that he is not talking about talking about Russia. He is talking about all four kingdoms that will rule over Israel. The book of James, chapter 7, verse 7. After this I saw in the night's vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in the horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things. Now let's go to the last one. Last and fourth piece, Daniel saw in his vision the Roman Empire. Now, this beast is also in the Tartums called Edom. This is the fourth beast. That's how the Tartum recognizes it. So when you think about Edom and when you think about who is controlling the earth, who is actually running and controlling the earth right now? The Roman Empire did not stop and end with Rome. There's a phrase that all of you need to go look up called the Holy Roman Empire. The Roman Empire includes and is the whole Western construct. The Roman Empire includes all of these entities. I call them entities because that's what they are. It includes the United States. It includes the whole of Europe. It includes South, South Africa. It also includes Israel. It also includes Vatican Roma. So it's not just one particular precinct or area. Yeah, no, no, this is the center of the universe. If I were living in Roman times, I would live in Rome. Where else? And today, America is the Roman Empire. New York is Rome itself, John. of Daniel chapter 7 verse 7 after this I saw in the night's vision and behold a fourth beast dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly and it had great iron teeth it devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it and it had ten horns Another uh, common thread is that this kingdom would be diverse from all other kingdoms. Now, you will notice about this particular kingdom, I mentioned several several different nationalities of people. But what I'm also going to mention is if you look at the United States and what they bring to most nations now is they bring together this myth of multiculturalism. The United States is considered a melting pot. They have also done that to parts of Europe. And so why have they done this? They're trying to bring you in, make you feel as if you're included. Your nations are diverse. This nation is diverse. Yeah, that is true. However, we should not be thinking about fighting in any wars that this nation gets us into because, number one, this nation is not a beacon. The United States is not a beacon for morality. It is not a beacon of good. It is not a beacon for justice. It is a beacon of wicked and evil. Point blank, period, just like that. 
The United States is 100% wicked. The United States is 100% evil. The Western, this Western construct called Rome is going around and destroying the whole earth. And they want to kill everybody on it, save themselves. That is the plan. You look at the Georgia Guidestones. Georgia Guidestones tell you that they want to reduce the population down to 500 million, but 500 million of who? 500 million of what people? And where are they getting this ridiculous idea from? That's a sick mind. Africa can't rise up because you are always involved. So how does the West ensure that the free aid keeps coming? By systematically destabilizing the wealthiest African nations and their systems, and all that backed by huge PR campaigns. Leaving the entire world under the impression that Africa is poor and dying and merely surviving on the mercy of the West. Well done, Oxfam, UNICEF, Red Cross, Life Aid, and all the other organizations that continuously run multi-million dollar advertisement campaigns depicting charity porn to sustain that image of Africa globally. Ad campaigns paid for by innocent people under the impression to help with their donations. While one hand gives under the flashing lights of cameras, the other takes in the shadows. We all know the dollar is worthless, while the euro is merely charged with German intellect and technology, and maybe some Italian pasta. How can one expect donations from nations that have so little? It's super sweet of you to come with your colored paper in exchange for our golden diamonds. But instead, you should come empty-handed, filled with integrity and honor. Edom is always involved using Hegelian dialect to destroy. The so-called African Americans here in the United States, we know why they can't rise. They need to get their act together. You need to get back to the law, statutes, and commandments and have faith in Mashiach, just like that. But Edom, oh man, the book, it said you are dreaded. And if I look at all the wickedness that you've done that you've been since you've been in power, you have done some wicked and terrible things to a lot of different people. But guess what? Come up and is coming to you. Trust and believe that. The most high not gonna let you get away. That's why you that's why you fear, have always feared entities or individuals like Nat Turner. You've always feared them because you know that we are supposed to be exacting vengeance on you. You know it. And it's coming. Saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because he did pursue his brother with the sword, and did cast off all pity, and his anger did tear perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. The Jerusalem Targums of Ankelos, Genesis 15 and 12 account. And when the sun was going to set, a sleep profound and sweet fell upon Abraham. And behold, Abraham saw four kingdoms which should arise to bring his sons into subjection. And terror, the greatness of darkness, fell upon him. Terror, that is Babel. Darkness, that is Madai. Greatness, that is Greece. Fell, that is Edom. Rome, the fourth kingdom which is to fall and never to rise again forever and ever. So based on the study that we've been doing in this documentary, we definitely, without no uncertain terms, know that the Targums and the Book of Daniel identifies this fourth beast as the Roman Empire. And so let's take a look at what the Jewish Encyclopedia says about who Roman. This is a Jewish Encyclopedia. The name Edom is used by Talmudists to describe the Roman Empire. And in every passage, it applies Rome as being Edom or Esau. So what does that tell you? The Israelis know that they are related to Rome. 
What's beautiful about, about the Roman Empire is that it tells on itself. It tells you how wicked they are and how foolish they are with their movies. Knowing that this movie was coming out, I we weren't surprised when it was banned. The reason, though, was different from the past. The cult Ministry of Culture saying that it showed history from a Zionist viewpoint and forged historical events. Egypt bans film Exodus, Gods, and Kings because of historical inaccuracies. Exodus, Gods, and Kings have received its fair share of criticism for whitewashing ancient Egyptians. And now the film has been banned in Egypt on the grounds of, quote, historical inaccuracies. Ridley Scott's epic, based on the Bible's book of Exodus, stars Christian Bale as Moses and Joel Egerton as Egyptian pharaoh Ramses. But despite the Hollywood pulling power, the country's censors were unimpressed with the film's claim that an earthquake sparked the famous parting of the Red Sea rather than a divine miracle and another suggestion that Jews... The director of Gods of Egypt, Alex Proyas, apologized for casting mostly white actors in his upcoming film based on Egyptian mythology. Where there shall arise false Christ. There shall arise false Christ. If the Bible never described Jesus Christ, how would you know if a false Christ was in front of you or not? You got to know what he looked like. You don't think the nations realize that? That's the reason why they're coming out with these things. To put you back in chains. Exactly. To put you back in mental destruction. To destroy your family. To destroy your children. That's what it's about. With their satanic practices? And not only that, but how they tell on themselves is what also their uh their their holidays, they Ellie days, they not they not holly nor is they hope. You got all these Babylonian practices that these people practice. Why is that? Huh? The the Khazaris ain't no more Israelites or Israel than than a Chinese man. Okay, so look at this paradox. Your Talmud tell you that you're wrong. But you tell the world with your face that you Israel. How is that? The Jewish encyclopedia telling you flat out who you are and what you are, and your wickedness and your practices show 100%. Who's the blood drinkers on the earth? There's no difference between Netanyahu and the Pope. Both of them drinking blood and sacrificing babies on some altar. The Catholic priest touching on children. The Catholic, what, who are we talking about? Idumia? What is I do me? It's the same as Edom. It's the same. It's the same as Israelis. It's the same as Romans. It's the same as Russians. It's the same as British. They all the same. And for those of you that think that Edom is not Rome, you go ask, you go ask a Talmudist what he thinks. And you go read their documentation and their literature and see what they think. And they'll tell you flat out, well, yeah. book of revelations chapter 11 verse 8 and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city which spiritually is called sodom in egypt where also our mashiach was crucified look at some of the characteristics and attributes of, of the roman empire you'll be able to really see that it's not just U.S., but it's a diverse and world empire or world kingdom. But if we look at their practices, it's definitely Egyptian. Um, you look at their money system. You look at the money, how they exchange. You look at the back of their money. It's got Egyptian symbology on it. Why is that? You ever ask your question, well, this is a, this is a different nation from Egypt, and yet we got pyramids, we got all-seeing eye, uh, we got some eagle with, with some... What's all that symbology mean and who does it, what does it mean to the individuals who are in the know? So look at, look at that very, very closely, folks. Start doing some research on what that really means because you will find that it all points back to the same source. Nile River. And as you can see, it flows all the way down, all the way down. And you see... Much of civilization started with this river as all these cities are all based around the river, including Thebes. But what else do you see? On this river, you see that about 30% of the land is separated to the east 
and about 60 or 70 percent to the west of the river. Now, what else do you see on this river? You see a city called Memphis. And if I zoom in a little bit, it's just south of Cairo, Memphis, right here. Where else have I heard that before? Let's keep going. Okay, so if we go here, what is one of the longest rivers in America? Not the longest, but one of them. The Mississippi. Wow, just like the Nile for Egypt. And let's see if I could get a bigger map here. Wow, about 30% of the land is east of this river and about the rest of the 60 is west, just like Egypt. 30% over here, 60% over there. It's no different, <gasps> but wait, you see this long river that gives America much life and substance, just like the Nile in Egypt. What city do you see on this river that matches this one right here memphis where else have i seen memphis before oh yeah memphis tennessee right here wow here is giza which is very close to memphis and as you can see here's the pyramid the pyramids of giza here's the sphinx and all of ancient egypt as they like to call it the cradle of civilization you see a pyramid right here in memphis in the Mississippi right here, just like you see the ancient pyramids right here, right close, right next to the Nile River. And the city that's on the Nile called Memphis in Africa's longest river, the river that gave civil life civilization, just like the river that gives America civilization right here, the Mississippi. And you see Memphis right there on that river. Where else do we see more facts and proof of ancient Egypt here in America today. Well, let's keep going. As we see here, we're back in Memphis. We're back at the pyramid. <gasps> Look who's there. They have a statue of Ramses the Great right in Memphis, right in front of the pyramid. Wow. An ancient, an ancient pharaoh that was probably worshipped as a god back then, right in front of the pyramid in current day modern day memphis tennessee just like they have the sphinx right in front of the pyramids of giza close to memphis egypt according to this map if we go a little bit south we can find the luxor which is in about this area here of modern day egypt it's still on the nile where else do we see a pyramid in today's egypt america with the luxor i know the luxor hotel in Las Vegas. This is a picture of the ancient city of Luxor and look at what you see. You see a big phallic symbol of the obelisk, which is a phallic symbol and is embedded with sun worship and Nimrod worship and ancient God worship and, and is in fact abominable with ancient statues and everything else. But where else do you see a pyramid and the Luxor? Here in Las Vegas, I see a pyramid right here in Las Vegas. And I see a Sphinx here in Las Vegas as well. Wow, that is that a coincidence? Could this be telling me that America is in fact modern day Egypt? It's all wicked and satanic. Let's look at the, uh, the, the, the practice of, of, of Sodom in the United States. It's okay for you to be LGBT. You have a damn man laying with another man. The book say that's an abomination and you should be killed. Am I advocating that you kill people? No, but you should go according to what the books say. And the books say that sodomy is an abomination to the most high. I can object to Paul and say, Dear Paul, maybe you are wrong. So a Bible was published by homosexuals, especially for themselves with a rainbow cross. A Bible in which the Holy Scripture is modified. In the real Bible, for example, it says, 
Thou shall not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. In the Gay Bible, Thou shall not lie with mankind as with womankind in the temple of Moloch. It is an abomination. Which means that sodomites are saying that it's not allowed to conduct homosexual acts in the temple of Moloch, but outside of it, it's acceptable. A lot of breaking news here this morning. The breaking uh, story just moments ago, the Supreme Court and this landmark ruling, the court uh, making same-sex legal, same-sex marriage legal in this country across every state in this nation. Let's look at the, the Babylonian practices. The Babylonian, what, what, what's your holidays? Y'all celebrate and spend tons of money economically on all of these wicked satanic holidays. You got Christmas. What do you, what do you so-called Christians, you so-called Americans, and you African Americans, so-called is you really Israelites? Y'all shouldn't be spending a damn nickel on Christmas. Now, last time I checked, and I could be wrong, the United States or one of these wicked nations may have made a rabbit that can lay eggs. I don't know. But last time I checked, a rabbit ain't laid no eggs. No, that's to the goddess Ashtar or Ashtar or whatever wicked name you want to call her. Here's for me the one big question. How do you get crucifixion, resurrection, and then chocolate bunnies, colored eggs? How do you do that one? Even kids are going, rabbits don't lay eggs. What is this? You can call it whatever you want. You can call it Ishtar, Ashtar, whatever. But that's to that wicked entity. The book is not talking about no good Friday. You want people to be patriotic and stand for the flag and celebrate the 4th of July when our people were slaves. What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him more than all other days of the year the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is a constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham. Your boasted liberty, an unholy license, your national greatness, swelling vanity. Your sound of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your denunciation of tyrants, brass-fronted impudence. Your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery. Your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings, with all your religious parade and solemnity, are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy, a thin veil to cover up crimes that would, that would disgrace a nation of savages. There's not a nation of the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of these United States at this very hour. At a time like this, scorching irony, not convincing argument, is needed. Oh, had I the ability and could reach the nation's ear, I would today pour forth a stream, a fiery stream of biting ridicule, blasting reproach, withering sarcasm, and stern rebuke. For it is not light that is needed, but fire. It is not the gentle shower, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind, the earthquake. The feeling of the nation must be quickened. The conscience of the nation must be roused. The propriety of the nation must be startled. The hypocrisy of the nation must be exposed. The crimes against God and man must be proclaimed and denounced. Think about that for a second. You celebrate a holiday when your people were slaves and the independence is not talking about your independence. 
The book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, verse 9. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Most High Allah, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood up upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dry, and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. So now if we take a, take a look at Revelations 11 and 8, and how it reads, and their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city. We look at the, the, the dead bodies. Look at the dead bodies of, of Sandra Bland, Tamir Rice, that breaks my heart. They all break my heart. Trayvon Martin, Mike Brown. And that's just the list that is growing day by day. In the past decade alone, January 24th, 2004, Timothy Stansberry, Brooklyn, New York unarmed. November 25th, 2006, Sean Bell, Queens, New York, unarmed. January 1, 2009, Oscar Grant, Oakland, California, unarmed. January 29th, 2010, Aaron Campbell, Portland, Oregon, unarmed. July 18th, 2011, Alonzo Ashley, Denver, Colorado, unarmed. March 7th, 2012, Wendell Allen, New Orleans, Louisiana, unarmed. September 14th, 2013, Jonathan Farrell, Charlotte, North Carolina, unarmed. July 17th, 2014, Eric Garner, Staten Island, New York, unarmed. August 9th, 2014, Michael Brown, Ferguson, Missouri, unarmed. In the past decade alone, these men and hundreds of others have lost their lives to police. Local police report to the FBI, killing at least 400 people a year. From 2006 to 2012, a white police officer killed a black person at least twice a week in this country. Which brings us back to Ferguson, Missouri. According to a report in the Daily Beast, in 2009, police officers charged a man for property damage because he bled on their uniforms while they arrested him and allegedly beat him bloody. Ferguson, Missouri, where it took six days to release the name of an officer who shot an unarmed teenager to death. Ferguson, Missouri, where police released images of someone who might be Michael Brown involved in a store robbery, and then hours later said the robbery had nothing to do with why Michael Brown was stopped by the police officer who killed him. Ferguson is just outside St. Louis, Missouri, the place where, as historian, Blair Kelly reminded us this week in The Root, Dred Scott sued for his freedom on the grounds that he and his wife had for three years, had for many years, lived in a free state. His case eventually went to the Supreme Court, and in 1857, Chief Justice Roger Taney declared that Scott had no right to sue because, as a black man, he was never intended to be an American. Speaking on the clause in the Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal, Taney wrote, quote, it is too clear for dispute that the enslaved African race were not intended to be included and formed no part of the people who framed and adopted this declaration. And he went on to say that black men had no rights, which the white man was bound to respect. No rights, which the white man was bound to respect. No rights, which the white man was bound to respect. No rights, which the white man was bound to respect. And the Bible says that their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city. These dead bodies represent the valley of dry bones. And the place is the land of our current captivity. That should be easy to spot and easy to understand because if you think about it, so-called Israel, so-called African-Americans, which you are really Israelites, you are still in captivity. You haven't left your captivity yet. You're in a land that is not yours. You speak a language that is not yours. So therefore, you are still in captivity. And these dead bodies 
and that are the Valley of Dry Bones represent you. The book of Matthew, chapter 25, verse 40. And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, and as much as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. The book of John, chapter 15, verse 20. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my sayings, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. <laughs> We have loved you consistently for 400 years. We prayed to that white Jesus, and we saluted your flag, and we died in your militaries, and you beat us like dogs. How dare you ask us have we loved you? I have a question for you. When in the hell have you ever loved anybody but yourself? Give me Ezekiel 35. I'm looking you square in your eye and, tell, and telling you this, that you are completely cruel. The book of Acts, chapter 5, verse 30. The Allah of our fathers raised up Mashiach, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. So let's look at um, the comparative notes of Mashiach and where he was uh, crucified, that land being spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. You can contrast with that with Acts 5 and 30, where the creator of our fathers raised up Mashiach, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. Let's take a look at that for a moment. It says whom you slew and hanged on a tree. He actually hung this man on a tree. When the plan burns a cross, it is a message. The next step will be a lynching. But as I watched the cross burning outside the church last night, it occurred to me that the crucifixion is just that, a lynching. And hanged on a tree. The crucifixion is just that, a lynching. And hanged on a tree. The crucifixion is just that, a lynching. And hanged on a tree and hanged on a tree, and hanged on a tree. Our people are dead. Negroes are dead. Walking zombies. You're the one that the book is talking about who is dead. Dead to the knowledge of yourself. Dead to the knowledge of your own people. Dead to the knowledge of your own God. Dead to the knowledge of the devil. Why, you don't even know who the devil is. You think the devil is someone down inside the ground that's going to burn you after you're dead. Why, the devil is bringing you on self this earth. He got blue eyes. Further contrast, if we take a look at Matthew 25 and 40, and, and what that says, and I'm going to short phrase it, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of my brethren, ye have done it also unto me. Now, if you contrast that with what I had previously said, you will see that what they do 
what they did to Mashiach, and he said this clearly, that they will be doing this for the least of his brethren. The least of his brethren being the Israelites. And so the same thing that they did to him, they will be doing it to you. And so the act of hanging someone is actually symbolic of hanging Mashiach and mocking Mashiach, mocking his people. They know exactly what they do. It's not by accident. They understand that when they hang someone, that they are doing this in direct representative or representation of them hanging the Mashiach. The book of Psalms, chapter 137, verse 4. How shall we sing the Most High song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. Remember, O Father, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it, even to the foundations thereof. O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, happy shall he be that rewarded thee as thou hast served us. Okay, so I want to bring us back to what was read in Psalms 137.7, where the book says, Remember, O Most High, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it. Now, raise it means to demolish and to destroy. And so Psalms 137 and 7 wants the foundation destroyed. We go down to verse 8 of Psalms 137. Old daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, is telling you that Edom, which is the daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed. Now, the daughter of Babylon is actually the United States. It's a subset of the whole Babylonian Roman Western Empire. So in each time you see daughter of Babylon, you are pointing to the United States. Oh, United States, who art to be destroyed. Happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. So how we have been treated here and how we have been done here, that is going to be done unto you, America. That is going to be done to you, O daughter of Babylon. You are going to be destroyed to your foundation. The books say you are going to be uninhabitable. So those of you that's trying to make your life here in America, trying to make our, everything all sweet, nice, and great, those of you preppers, those of you who dig in, dig in these tunnels, like Dick Chang, you trying to hide yourself in a, in a tunnel, you know Mashiach is coming, he will come and snatch you up out of that tunnel, and he's going to kill you. He's going to destroy this wicked place. Now let's take a look at the, um, let's further investigate this. Let's take a look at what this reveals and, and, and get some clarity about, even more clarity about this daughter of Babylon. This daughter of Babylon is not only associated with the Persians, but it's also associated, as I said earlier, with Esau. The practices of this place, we talked about that earlier, uh, how we worship here, in other words, uh, how the people here under the false religions, such as Christianity, such as Islam, such as Buddhism, you can name, all, and such as atheism, such as both your, your Republican and Democrats, that's another religion. The Masonic temples, that's another religion. All these things that you have a belief in is a religion. Now, what is the most the important thing about the about having the Persian and Babylonian practices associated with, with Esau is that the scripture confirms this and refers to the last kingdom as Babylon. Consistently, it's referred to as Babylon. And that the Most High consistently tells it, Israel or Yasharala to come out of Babylon. So how do you come out of Babylon, Yasharala? You should already know that. The point being made here is that this final kingdom is going to be have all the other wicked kingdoms before it that ruled Yasharala wrapped up into one. You'll be able to point to Persian influence. You'll be able to point to Babylonian influence. You'll be able to point to Egyptian influence. I'll say something. 
You. You people. You have a race. You are a virus. You destroy the world. Everything beautiful. You poison. You drag us from our homes. You rape our daughters, murder our sons. You crack our spines and do all you can to break our will. You stab us. Then you put the knife in our hand and tell us it's our fault. And if you don't do it yourself, you stand by, close your eyes, and pretend there's nothing wrong. And then you pray to your God to silence our screams so that you can enjoy the happiness that we built for you with our blood. But it's not your fault. It's the only way you know how to be. And the only thing that will change anything is if another virus comes along and does to you what you do to us. And I hope that happens very soon. The Book of Revelation, chapter 18, verse 2. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Okay, so let's take a look at Revelations 18, 2 through 4. Revelations 18 and 2, and he, and he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. But the key part it says, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and caged in every unclean and hateful bird. Now, if you look at the nations of the earth, what nation does that sound like? America is not the standard bearer of morality America is the standard bearer of evil. All of these politicians is devils. In 1897, racism was in the world. That's right. That's right. Right? You agree with me? Okay, so don't talk about Elijah like he invented racism. Racism was in the world. You got to understand now that he was born into a world where he was witnessing black men being lynched. He grew up in that era where black men were hung for no reason, where we were subject to all manner of disgusting treatment and disgusting laws. Ku Klux Klan killing us, burning us at the stake for no reason other than the fact that we were black people. Adolf Hitler engineered a program where he caused six million to be killed in gas chambers during the Second World War. Go to any self-respecting Jew today and ask them, what is Adolf Hitler? And they will tell you he was a devil. What is a devil? The word devil is a term that means, the word devil is a term that means one who devalues, a devaluer. Those Jewish lies were valuable in the eyes of God. But here is a man that comes along now and takes away the value of human beings and destroys them as a human reality. That is the act of a devil. Human beings who are devils in the manifest evil that they do. Now, that was over four years that Hitler was doing his devilishment. Teach. We can count back 400 years, 100 years. 100. of the most brutal treatment. Look, they took my name, my language, my culture. They killed my mother, my father, denied me religion, disallowed me to read or write for over three years. 
hundred years. Reduced me to the level of an animal where they branded me on my chest, branded me on my buttocks with a branding iron. And they called me three-fifths of a human being in the American Constitution. Is that the act of a human being or the act of a devil? It says, for all nations have drunk of the wine of her wrath. Now listen to this. All nations, just like Psalms 83 says, has always conspired against us, has always tried to press us down. Look at our neighborhoods. Who's making money off of us? You can't keep banging your head against a wall and expecting the wall to give. That shit is cement. These people hate us. They hate us. Oh, it was mine. You take my purse. Get off. Get off. Hit me. No. Get off me. Are you, you're tricking me. When your bread and butter is black people, the last thing I'm going to do is piss off black people because I know they can end my business. But the reason why he had no problem doing what he did to her is because other groups of people really don't respect black people. And I'm going to tell you why they don't respect black people. It's not that what they like to say to you, well, we don't respect you because you can hurt each other. We don't respect you. No, no. They don't care less about you killing off each other. That's not even the issue. They don't respect you because they have the pimp and hoe relationship with black people and black people being the hoe. They are the pimp. I'm not talking about just Asians. I'm talking about whites and anybody else. Now, let me explain to you what I mean by the pimp and hoe relationship. We are the hoe, and I'm talking about we as a collective, to everybody. Everybody use us and say, bring me my money. And we do this willingly. They see you. They see you coming. They call you blip with money. Why? Because they're going to get every nickel out of you. Listen, the Western construct was built on the backs of the so-called African-Americans, the so-called slaves that were dispersed throughout the whole earth. Europe would not have become Europe had not they had free slave labor. It doesn't matter whether you were around during slavery. It doesn't matter if your ancestors owned them or not. What matters is this. You benefit today from the enslavement of African people. And everyone who looks like you benefits in some way, shape, or form from the accrual of resources, of wealth, and of financial status that was reaped on the backs of my ancestors. The book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 20. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. Hebrews 11 and 20, as it states, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau. Now he blessed them concerning future things. So this is prophetic, how he blessed them. And this will be a perpetual blessing because it will go on and on and on and they would exude these particular uh, tendencies throughout their whole history. Now, this particular verse will be the foundation in understanding Esau's role and also identifying Esau's role through scripture and through prophecy. And you should be able to look at the blessings of each, both Jacob and Esau, and determine who's who and do a comparison of the blessings based on your observance today. The book of Genesis, chapter 27, verse 37. And Isaac answered and said unto Esau, Behold, I have made him thy master, and all his brethren have I given to him for servants. And with corn and wine have I sustained him. And what shall I do now unto thee, my son? And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me. Even me also, O oh my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And Isaac his father answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above. And by thy sword shalt thy live and shalt serve thy brother. And it shall come to pass when thou shalt have the dominion 
that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. So let's take a look at the, the foundation of understanding Esau's role concerning scripture and prophecy. What we want to look at here is we want to look at the blessings that Esau was given and then also look at the attributes of these blessings. And then we'll make the comparison of what we see in Esau today. This right here will be able to allow you to identify exactly who Esau is. Behold. Thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth. Now, let's take a look at that for a second. Who controls the oil? Your dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth, which means that you would have the best of the earth. You wouldn't be lacking in nothing at all. Who got all the gold? Well, it's definitely not Jacob. So the fatness of the earth, that's what he was promised, and that's what he got. Now, let's take a look at 27 and 40 right quick. And you could read the beginning of this and understand exactly who you are dealing with. And by the sword shalt thou live. Now, if you look at Esau, is Esau not a warlike entity? That's all that's on Esau's mind. Is that he want to go out and kill? Let's show him what the United States of America looks like up close and personal. Show him what a B-1 bomber looks like flying overhead. Show him what they're messing with. Put the fear of God in their desert. In most countries, the citizens know who they're at war with. But here in the United States, it's sometimes a little difficult to keep track of who we're bombing at any given moment. Do you know how many countries the U.S. is currently bombing? In fact, we're currently bombing seven different countries. The fact that we're bombing Iraq should come as no surprise. As The Onion points out, we've been bombing them off and on for about 25 years now. The other country that shouldn't come as too much of a surprise is Afghanistan. We invaded them way back in 2001 in response to the 9-11 attacks. We've been fighting there for 15 years now, and there's no end in sight. And as part of our war in Afghanistan, we're also bombing Pakistan. We're also bombing a country called Yemen. Another country we're bombing is Libya. And finally, the seventh country we're currently bombing is Somalia. Back in March, an American drone killed 150 people. It seems as though every major international conflict ends up involving the United States at some point, whether through lawful warfare, protecting Americans abroad, or just outright invading another country, the U.S. has imposed itself on nearly every nation on Earth. Look at the Crusades. The Crusades had nothing to do with Mashiach, had nothing at all to do with the Most High. That's how these people live. When an Edomite thinks about, about something, what does he do? He doesn't think about reasoning with you. What he's going to do is he's going to say, okay, you're going to do what we say, or we're going to bomb the hell out of you, point blank, just like that. Edom is not going to negotiate with you. He is going to kill you. This is how these people are. This is they, patholog they pathologically cannot live with other people in peace. They want to kill you, and that's how they live. Michael Vick still, to this day, is being told that he's inhumane and that he's a criminal and he's demonized for him not even making dogs fight himself, but for other people doing it around him. But yet you got these two psychopaths who are tying up a therapy dog and filming it for fun. And understand that this is also a part of their pathology because they, they're violent and savage prone. That's what they do for fun. The same way that they were torturing black people for fun, it's the same way they're doing this to these animals for fun. But the mainstream media will like to keep this quiet so that you don't see it, so you don't really see the real nature of these people. Because the reason why they've been able to get away with it for so long is because they control the media, so they control what people think about them despite what they're actually doing and what their real pathology is. It shall come to pass when thou shall have the dominion. Now, a problem that I have with, with most people when they read the Bible or the book is that we don't try to break down each word and try to understand what those words actually mean. So I'm going to look at the focus on the word dominion. What does dominion mean? First, we're going to look at it from the Strong's. Then we're going to look at the actual definition. Let's look at what the Strong says about this particular word. And let's not let any word going forward get by you. When you read a scripture or a precept, decode it. We're going to go to the Strong's Concordance, 
H7300, Strong's Concordance H7300 reads, a primitive root to tramp about, that is ramble, free or disconsolate, have the dominion, be lord, mourn, and finally rule, okay? That's coming from the Strong's. Now, let's go ahead and Google the word dominion. And this is where we're getting our definition from, from the Google version, dominion. And it reads, it's a noun, one, sovereignty, control. The synonyms are supremacy, ascendancy, dominance, domination, superiority, predominance, preeminence, hegemony, authority, mastery control command power sway rule government jurisdiction and sovereignty now if i look at that that last wow that definition is powerful because if it if we go back to genesis 27 and 40 thou shalt have do, the the dominion not some dominion not a little bit do, a dominion not partial dominion it says that thou shalt have the dominion so if you have the dominion what are you faced with what are the people of the earth faced with the people of the earth are going to be faced with white supremacy the people are going to be faced with their control and their dominance the people are also going to be faced with their domination of the earth and controlling everything of the earth the people are going to be faced with hegemony countless hegemony and no matter what they do their command and their power and their sway is over everything. It's over your food. It's over your people. It's over your belief system. It's over your religion. It's over your schools. It's over everything. Your educational system. Your government is part of the dominion and control. Where you live, what you think, you have been dominated. But the truth is this, that the reason that some communities are war zones and some are not, is not at bottom about the number of guns in those communities. What makes a community safe is not the number of guns, but the number of good schools, the number of good jobs, the number of educational opportunities, the numbers of opportunities people have for living a decent life. We do not realize that the massive deaths of black males constitute the genocide of black people as it takes black males to make black babies and ensure future black generations. So essentially, if you take the black, or excuse me, if you take the male lion from the herd of, of lions, you will no longer be able to procreate lions. If you take the male organism of any population, that species no longer can procreate. So with the attack of black men, it is understood with the fear of genetic annihilation because you have to destroy the, the man that the, that holds the seed. Black men hold the seeds. We as black women incubate the seed for nine months. Four examples of where men, black men's procreation have been hindered, have been altered, have been deterred is um, one, the Tuskegee experiment in Macon County, Alabama from 1932 to 1972 where black men were intentionally given syphilis being told they were being treated for bad blood. Two, the new Jim Crow mass incarceration in the age of colorblindness by Michelle Alexander, a phenomenal book where she wrote about the mass incarceration of black males um, with the false war on drugs issued by Ronald Reagan in 1982. Psychoacademic war on black male youth, which was uh, first educated to me by uh, Dr. Omar Johnson, where he does an amazing example explaining where black male boys are misdiagnosed and diagnosed falsely with dyslexia, ADHD, schizophrenia, and put on these uh, medicines that are highly toxic to the body, that are highly addictive, like Ritalin, Risperdal, causing breasts to grow on Black men, and lastly, the emasculation of the Black male, which has been happening and transpiring from some time. If Esau and Edom rule, then how does that make uh, Japheth the white man? Because if Japheth is the white man, where in the book says that Japheth will be ruled? Does it ever say that anyway? Can somebody find me a precept where Jaffa will be ruling at the end? Can that, If you can find that precept, I'll go with it. I'll go with it and I'll believe. But if you can't find that precept, you need to stand down. Show me where Jaffa is 
is going to be ruling at any time. If you could do that, please show me that. If you could do it, I'll go with it. But if Chapman is 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 the so-called white man, then how is it? We, we, we got a problem with the book then. You got a problem with the book. The book says shall have the dominion. They are preeminent on this earth right now. The Apocrypha, 2nd Edris, chapter 6, verse 9. For Esau is the end of the world, and Jacob is the beginning of it that follows. So looking at the account in the Apocrypha, in 2nd Edris 6 and 9, this is, this is a very, very interesting point. What the book says, it says Esau is the end of the world. So who do you know that is the end of the world when the world is going to be ending and they would be ruling? But then it also says prophetically that Jacob is the beginning of it that follows. Esau, you are ruling right now and the world is about to go into the pit of darkness. And of course, it's going to happen on your under your rulership. But Jacob is the beginning of it that follows, which means that once you go be brought down by the Most High, that Jacob will go into the fullness of its rulership and start ruling the world righteously. The book of Obadiah, chapter 1, verse 1. The vision of Obadiah, thus said the Most High Allah Hayim concerning Edom. We have heard a rumor from the Most High, and an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise ye, and let us rise up against her in battle. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art greatly despised. The pride of thy heart hath deceived thee, thou that dwelleth in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nests among the stars, Thence will I bring thee down, said the Most High. Now, if you look at Obadiah, there's only one race who acknowledges that they have dwelt in the clefts of the rock, number one, and that they come from the Caucasus Mountains, to be exact, and they call themselves Caucasians. Now, what race of people is that? Oh, Petra is also called by other names in the Bible. Uh, Selah, Mount Hor, Mount Seir, the rock city of the Edomites, and many other names. There's only one group of people that when they were also in uh, other parts of the earth, that they would build themselves into the clefts of the rock. You can identify them through the banner, the banner of the eagle. And who are they? They are the Edomites. They are Esau. They are the Idumeans. They are the Romans. They are the Vatican. They are Babylon. They are spiritual Egypt. They are the rulers, the wicked rulers of the earth. They are the sodomites. They are also known as Americans. You got nothing. You've got no power over nothing. This is a white man's country. This is a white man's world. The white man from Europe dominates the whole planet. White men go into any country and kill everybody, take over anything they want. This is a white man's country. It's a white man's world. I'm not bragging about it. I'm just telling, I'm just telling you the fact of the matter. White people out of Europe have dominated Europe and have dominated the then Europe has dominated the world. And so England has manipulated and exploited the races, the peoples of the world. The white man has been using uh, exploitation, commerce to manipulate and exploit the whole human race. So I cannot believe that some young black guy walks in and he's going to take over the old white man's establishment on the earth. Ain't going to happen. Shalom, shalom, brother. Can you hear me, brother? Are you there? Are you there, brother Elisha? All right, so the brother Elisha is not back yet. But uh, so that video right there was one of the first second Exodus videos we did, right? 
And that, I believe it thoroughly explained who we would be under subjection to as concerning the 400-year prophecy. Now, let me get a one if you feel like that adequately explained who we will be dealing with in this current kingdom as concerning the 400-year prophecy. Let me get a one from everybody who feels like that that gave them enough information to be secure in what we're dealing with here. All right, great. So everybody everybody was able to digest that, right? And, and understand the points of view which that was presented in that video, right? Now, that video was a prerequisite to the 400-year prophecy video that we did, uh, I want to say maybe a, a year or two later, concerning uh, the actual breakdown of the prophecy, right? Um, did, did you have anything to add concerning that video, Brother Lasha? Did you have anything no, to make any remarks? Not, not to add anything, but to say that everything was disseminated in a way where it should leave no doubt regarding who we are and who Edom is. We talk about the prophecies. We talk about the history. We're talking about our first-hand account of the treatment that we have suffered in this land. Like we are witnesses to these things. How the scriptures say, ye are my witnesses. And we would be no greater witness on the earth than to the atrocities and the slavery and the oppression that we've suffered. We're the greatest witnesses to what and who, what nations did not keep the law, statutes, and commandments of the Most High. Which nations abused us? Which nations oppressed us? Which nations stole our names and ripped our heritage from us? We can easily identify Esau or Edom according to their treatment of our people and know that we are within the fourth beast, that fourth nation, the Eagle, you know, all, all that information that was put in the video and put inside a, a lot of the lessons should be clear, you know, and then that's not to chastise or come against anything that our other brothers might say, because for in large part, we're in unison on this subject. Thank you. You know, um, so when we, when we did that video, like I was saying, it was a prerequisite to the actual teaching on the 400 year prophecy, because we wanted to get people an understanding of what we was dealing with first before we even went into the specifics of explaining that prophecy. But, you know, um, fate would have it or the most high would have it that there would be several unbelievers and several people who would try to, you know, refute the 400 year prophecy not based off of uh not based off of any real information that they had but just based off of a lot of different um situations concerning their doctrines right so we have put out a couple of 400 year uh prophecy videos you know um nothing really really delving deep into anything just really talking about it being us. But again, as the most how it have it, people begin to kick against the pricks. At which point I decided that it would be helpful and edifying for those who believe the 400 year prophecy to receive something from us that will would, would affirm their understanding and their belief that this is actually us. You know, um, and another thing was, look, sort of the Earth Production Channel was created so that we could give brothers and sisters a light at the tunnel and understand that there's hope for our people, that this captivity that we're in will come to an end, right? But for those who were kicking against that, you know, we, we had to come back with something um, equally uh, as stunning as that video uh brother lasha yeah brother can you hear me 
Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, and, and also, and this this is the thing we, we want people to understand, too. The brother did disseminate that before these videos were even put out, that we were in long discussions with our brothers, not just in this country, but our brothers that def definitely have their feet down in Israel. And we privy to situations there with our brothers who live in Israel, our brothers who live in Egypt, our brothers who live in Damascus, where these st these discussions before we even thought to put a video out, and even the times where we put feet on the ground regarding this issue when we stood in front of the White House, when we stood in front of the United Nations. Matter of fact, brother, you mind if we play a short video just showing a quick recap of that? Absolutely. Go for it, brother. Matt, yeah, matter of fact, let me grab it up real quick. We're going to just watch a short video for when we have feet on the ground on this subject. And we're talking about even when we went to the, the Million Man March and we documented a lot of, uh, a lot of the, the, the situations that led to a lot of the videos you're seeing now on this subject. So these things were going on long before we even that videos were even put out, that we were in these discussions. And his brothers, that have their feet on the ground in Israel right now that a lot of y'all don't know yet, but you soon will know that have been in these discussions. Let me grab up this video, brother. Give me two shakes of a lamb still. Absolutely. You know, um, what, and what the brother is really trying to explain is and what I was trying to explain also is that we're not just some Johnny come lately when it's concerning the work and the study and the um, research about this information. You know, um, we we paired out with, with with several brothers that are also very learned in this information. You know that that could you know you can sit any scholar, any um, you know um, theological, uh, you know uh, the, theological uh, professor before them, and we could argue our points before you. You know, and and, and adequately explain why we believe what we believe. And it makes sense, right? And it would it would make sense according to scripture. Scripture will affirm that and also uh, attribute to the understanding, right? So, you know, there's a lot of people out there right now who just I don't know why, but they don't want to believe the information. And today you're gonna get it again. For those brothers and sisters who haven't had the opportunity to see the four in a year prophecy, truth versus scoffers. We're going to play that after the brother shows this information also. Now, with this, with this information, I would suggest that you get a pen in the pad because there's going to be points brought out that will help you argue against anyone who would uh, want to cast doubt within your mind. You know, um, are you are you ready, brother? Yeah, yeah, I'm ready, bro. Let me let me um share my screen. Yeah, because uh, the video is not on YouTube anymore, but it's uh saved to the computer. So let me um share my screen real quick, okay. and we'll play this video. And let me know if y'all can hear everything. Let me see. Uh, share screen, brother. Let me know if the sound comes through when I go to put the video on. Okay. All right. So let me know if you hear the sound right now. I hear it. All right. So let me go on and expand my screen. You're not African Americans, but they want you to believe you are. You are Hebrew Israelites. Now, this is in 2014. 2014. You have a nationality. We've been at it for years. For years, we've been my people. Go ye out of the midst of her and deliver ye every man his soul from the fierce anger. Of a high. You see that? We're supposed to leave this place. Black sovereign Hebrew Israelites that are actually sovereign American nationals of the 50 sovereign states of the Union of the United States of America. Big Black sovereign Hebrew Israelites, American nationals, have not ignored the section of the 14th Amendment related to the United States. And he said unto Abel, Know the surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not there, and shall serve them, and they shall put them four hundred years. Also, that nation whom they shall serve with thy judge, and after that. They shall come out with great we have here. Our national world Hebrew Israelite flag, according to prophecy, right here today, in front of the White 
2015 when we had feet on the ground teaching these things that's not even to mention the videos and the work that came from a, a, from the information that y'all are seeing now so this is not something new even going to the million man march and hear Farrakhan like when the brother showed the clip of Farrakhan talking about we're the children of Israel that happened back in 2015 we was there feet on the ground so all the work you're seeing here is not like we just sat down and we started putting together work we have feet on the ground teaching these things life limb and jeopardy life limb and jeopardy we put ourselves to show our people that uh th this 400 year prophecy is real and i'm talking about years before we got to the precipice now where things are even more uh detrimental even more dire that we understand that our time is now Yeah, absolutely. And and what I want to do is I want to cue in this next video called the uh, the 400 year prophecy truth versus scoffers, because this video was an answer to all those people that have something to say concerning the 400 years. We've heard everything, uh, you know, false prophets. You guys don't know the Bible. It didn't say 400 years, you know. So I thought it was good that we take some time to break this thing down so that anybody could understand it. And to this day, since this video has came, uh, come out, no one has been able to refute it. So I'm telling you, every one of my brothers and sisters in there, even if you're not our brothers and sisters, you if you, um, you don't consider yourself an Israelite, whoever you are out there, everybody that's within this, within this chat that's watching, this video that we are going to show you is absolute proof and has not been refuted by anyone anywhere. Now, we know people seen this video because people have tried to address certain things, but, you know, um, by ways of straw man arguments and things like that. But let's take a look at this video, which we call the 400 year prophecy. Truth versus scoffers. If you like the first one, you're definitely going to like this one because this right here proves without a shadow of a doubt that the 400 year prophecy applies to us. So I'm going to mute my mic and brother, brother Lasha, um, keep your keep your mic on for the first couple of seconds of the video to make sure uh, you can let me know if you hear it or not. Right, or you know what? 
before the before we be going, just wanted to say that um some of the brothers that was with us back at those times, like we're not with every brother that did the work with us then, even though we all still believe the same thing regarding the four hundred years. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, so Am I on the right track? Just wanted to make sure I was muted so it is no interference. Yeah, yeah, the sound did come through, so you good, bro. I am not this deliverer you fear. It would take more than a man to lead the slaves from bondage. It would take a god. For I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart and upon thy servants and upon thy people, that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. For now I will stretch out my hand that I may smite thee and thy people with pestilence and thou shalt be cut off from the earth. And in very deed, for this cause have I raised thee up, for to show in thee my power, and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. The United Nations says locust swarms are threatening the food supply of millions. Tonight, there will be a super blood wolf moon. I'm not making that up. UK scientists are saying the bushfires in Australia are a warning of what may be to come around the world. This is more than a thousand cattle have died at a farm in Basbank near Dundee in northern KwaZulu Natal. The reason behind the deaths of the herds of cattle is still unknown. The cattle have right now in the United States, one of the world's largest volcanoes is gearing up to explode. In Indonesia, ash and sand covered areas several miles away from the peak of the rumbling crater. In the meantime, let's talk about these waters that are turning the color of blood red in recent. However, we did learn overnight that deaths across the United States have now topped 1,000. The tri-state still outpacing the rest of the country. Italy saw its deadliest day from the coronavirus as the death toll jumped by more than 600 in 24 hours. Hospitals are filled and medical professionals overwhelmed and exhausted. <laughs> The evil that men should turn their brothers into beasts of burden. To slave and suffer in dumb anguish. To be stripped of spirit and hope and faith only because they are of another race, another creed. If there is a God, he did not mean this to be so. You told us we were free. Well, then show us that we're free. You told us that there is justice, equality for all in this country. Well, then kids, stick to your word and let us see the justice and equality for all. Or else admit to us that you're not a man. You're a worm. You're afraid of us. You're afraid to give us equal stand. You're afraid that if you give us equal ground, that we will match you and we will override you. And if that's what you're afraid of us, then, then tell us that just what you're afraid of. Yet during this whole process, we continue to watch the rich get richer in this country. And not to mention, ain't no good going to come to America until they do right by black folks. Period. You can't continue to brutalize and kill the descendants of God's children that built this country. Do you understand what that does to us, you know, mentally and emotionally?
All this country needed was a reason, and America has given black people 400 plus years of reasons to go crazy. I'm actually shocked that we didn't snap a long time ago. Do what you say this country is supposed to be about, the land of the free for all. It has not been free for black people, and we are tired. Don't talk to us about looting. Y'all are the looters. America has looted black people. America looted the Native Americans when they first came here. So looting is what you do. We learned it from you. We learned violence from you. We learned violence from you. The violence was what we learned from you. So if you want us to do better, then damn it, you do better. God will punish all of us. God will punish all of us. I have said it. I have said it now. And God is already there doing it. Why is it that this virus is just attacking us? It's not attacking blacks like that. It's only attacking the whites because of what? God is punishing us. It's real difficult talking to people that already have a negative connotation about you. I'm sure all y'all black people out there, I'm going to use that word black, had white people stereotype y'all and marginalize y'all another way. To do that to your brothers and sisters is dead wrong. But you have to know that blacks are the first creature of God. And if anyone deals with them, God will deal with you. Okay, uh, this is going to be a lesson concerning the 400 years spoken unto Abraham by the Most High, which some may know as the 400 year prophecy. I'm going to be going in depth in revisiting previous information of whether or not the prophecy was fulfilled in Egypt or if it is yet to be fulfilled. I'm also going to examine the opposition's claim on the matter to find out if their denial that the 400 years of affliction is happening now is sincere on their behalf, or if there's an agenda to suppress the information. We will also take a look at the importance of the prophecy and the impact it is to have on the view of who we are as a people staking claim to being the children of Israel. Okay, now, when someone examines this prophecy, they have to take into account all the stipulations why do I say this? Well, that is because if the pieces are missing, that will cause the prophecy to seem as if it has not been fulfilled. The burden of proof mainly lies on those who say that the 400 years of affliction was fulfilled in Egypt because they have to show each part of the prophecy coming in the past. How many pieces must be missing or proven to not have happened for a prophecy to have not come to pass. One, just one. Unless those who say the prophecy happened in Egypt can reconcile the points of contention, they shouldn't speak on the prophecy being fulfilled. Once again, I'm going to go into a few books, seven to be exact. I'll be using first and foremost the KJV Bible, the Septuagint, Bible translation, the book of Jasher, the book of Jubilees, the works of Flavius Josephus, the Targums of Ankylos, and the Dead Sea Scrolls. So let's start with the prophecy written in Genesis chapter 15, starting at verse 12. We're going to examine the verses and ask what they are saying. Then we're going to do a comparison of these verses with other verses that speak on the same prophecy. From the King James Virgin Bible, Genesis chapter 15 in verse 12 to verse 14. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham. And lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abraham, Know of a surety 
that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they shall afflict them 400 years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. Okay, so we read it. And what we find out is the stipulations of the prophecy state that one, Israel would be strangers in a land that is not theirs. Two, that they would serve them. Three, they would be afflicted 400 years in that place. Four, that the nation whom they should serve will I judge. And five, afterwards shall they come out with great substance. All these stipulations must be fulfilled in order for this prophecy to have come to pass or be completed. All right, so the first question asked would be, was Israel strangers in a land that is not theirs when they were in the land of Egypt? We know Abraham frequented in Egypt and that Jacob knew where to send his sons when the famine hit. But why would the stipulation state strangers in a land that is not theirs okay so then let's take a look at the definition of stranger from the merriam webster dictionary okay it says stranger one a foreigner two a resident alien and on the side it has a b c d and e b it says one in the house of another or a guest visitor or intruder C, a person or thing that is unknown or with whom one is unacquainted. D, one who does not belong to or is kept from the activities of a group. E, one not privy or party to an act, contract, or title. One that interferes with without rights. And the second definition, it says one ignorant of or acquainted with someone or something. Okay, so that's the definition of stranger from the Merriam Webster Dictionary. Okay, so if someone is a stranger in a land, there is no need to state the obvious that the land is not theirs. But this stipulation, though it seems redundant, has a purpose to why it is worded this way. So let's take a look at exactly where the Israelites would dwell while they were in Egypt. From the King James Virgin Bible, Genesis chapter 47, verse five to verse six. And Pharaoh spake unto Joseph saying, thy father and thy brethren are come unto thee. The land of Egypt is before thee and the best of the land make thy father and brethren to dwell. In the land of Goshen, let them dwell. And if thou knowest any man of activity among them, then make them rulers over my cattle. Now, at first glance, these verses may not mean much, but to those who study the prophecy given unto Abraham by the Most High would notice that the geographical area of Goshen in which they lived was within the borders of the land that the Most High promised Abraham he would give to his seed or descendants. We find this in Genesis chapter 15, verse 18, and it says, from the King James Virgin Bible, Genesis chapter 15, verse 18, in the same day, the Most High made a covenant with Abraham, saying, unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. So, according to Genesis 15 and 18, Abraham's seed was given the land from the river of Egypt unto the great river Euphrates. All right, then. The first question we're going to ask is, what is the river of Egypt? Now, the Smith Bible Dictionary says, River of Egypt, one, the now, and it has Genesis 15 and 18 in parentheses as reference, all right? And then it has two, a desert stream on the border of Egypt, still occasionally flowing in the valley called Wadi El Ares, 
All right, so I'm going to stop right there. So, the Most High said, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Now we know that the river of Egypt spoken of in Genesis 15 and 18 is speaking of the Nile River. The land that the Most High gave Israel begins at the border of the Nile River. So, let's take a moment to look at a couple of maps to see where exactly Goshen is located in relation to the area the Most High promised to give Abraham seed. All right. So this first map, both the Euphrates and the Nile is on it. You can see the Euphrates River on the right side of the map running through Mesopotamia. And you can see the Nile at the bottom left side of the map. So now let's take a look at a map of the Nile River alone. All right. As you can see, the Nile River travels all the way down to Lower Egypt, where it branches out into the Mediterranean Sea. And on the right side of the map, you can see the Red Sea. We're going to take a closer look at the Nile River, though, to get a better understanding of its location in relation to Goshen. Okay, good. Now, if you look on the left side of the map, once again, you see the Nile River flowing through Egypt into the Mediterranean Sea. But on this map, you can also see the land of Goshen on the map. So, what we see is that Goshen sits right at the border of the Nile River. Let's take one more look at another map of the Nile in relation to Goshen. Now, as this map is somewhat magnified, what do you see? Once again, you see Goshen on the border of the Nile River as it runs through Egypt. Now, I'm going to show the Nile and the Euphrates in comparison so we can see if Goshen was within the land the Most High promised to Abraham's seed. Okay, great. So what we find out from these scriptures and these maps is that Israel was dwelling in the land the Most High promised to give Abraham's seed the whole time, the land of Goshen. The land was theirs all along. Not just that, but there's a difference between all the kingdoms that Israel would serve under. And that is that Egypt was the only place Israel served under while dwelling in their own land. No land was promised within the borders of any of the other kingdoms that Israel would serve under. The purpose for that is so that the reader of the prophecy would be able to differentiate the bondage in Egypt from all the other bondages, seeing that they must be, one, strangers in a land that is not theirs in order to fit the prophecy. So that's one stipulation that does not fit the time that Israel served in Egypt. So we are going to move on to the next stipulation, which states that Israel would serve them. This stipulation is one that is easy to see happening in any captivity because Israel would already be enslaved. Thus, they would have no choice but to serve or be subservient to their captors. Servitude, however, has a broader understanding when we examine the biblical definition of it. Okay, we're going to look at the Browns Drivers Briggs definition, and it's pronounced abad in the Hebrew, and it says one, to work. And then it also has one A, it says qual, and one A1, it says to labor, work, do work, 1A2, to work for another, serve another by labor, 1A3, to serve as subjects, 1A4, to serve God, 1A5, to serve with Levitical services, and then it has 1B, and that says nafal, and this 1B1 says to be worked, be tilled, 
of land, 1B2, to make oneself a servant. And then you have 1C, and it says Paul to be worked. All right. And then it goes on and it says to compel to labor or work, cause to labor, cause to serve, 1D2, to cause to serve as subjects. All right. So that's the Brown's Drivers Briggs definition of it. Next, we're going to get the Strong's and see what the Strong says. All right, now, so the Strong Concordance also pronounces it as Abad in the Hebrew. And it says, a primitive root to work in any sense by implication to serve till consecutively enslave, etc., be keep in bondage, be bondmen, bond service, compel, do dress, ear, execute, husbandman, keep labor, laboring man, bring to pass, cause to make to, serve, become, servants, service till, transgress margin, set at work, be walked worshipers. And it says to fall, to be led or enticed to serve. So to serve can mean not only to be enslaved, but it includes working for men and even worshiping other gods. Now let's take a look at a few scriptures involving Israel's servitude of a people in a land that the Israelites would be complete strangers to. Preset time. From the King James Version Bible, Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 4. And thou, even thyself, shalt discontinue from thy heritage that I gave thee, and I will cause thee to serve thy enemies in a land which thou knowest not. For ye have kindled a fire in my anger, which shall burn forever. From the King James Version Bible, Jeremiah chapter 16, verse 12 to verse 13. And ye have done worse than your fathers, for behold, ye walk everyone after the imagination of his evil heart, that they may not hearken unto me. Therefore will I cast you out of this land into a land that ye know not, neither ye nor your fathers. And there shall ye serve other gods day and night, where I will not show you favor, a land ye know not. It doesn't take much to see that these verses are speaking of our current captivity. Not only that, but see these verses in comparison to the stipulations one and two, strangers in a land that is not theirs, and serve them. We see that this current captivity fits the prophecy to a T. From the King James Version Bible, Genesis chapter 15, verse 13. And he said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs. Land that is not theirs. From the King James Virgin Bible, Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 19. And it shall come to pass when ye shall say, Wherefore doeth the Most High our Allah all these things unto us? Then shalt thou answer them, Like as ye have forsaken me, and serve strange gods in your land, so shall ye serve strangers in a land that is not yours. Land that is not yours. So, Jeremiah 5 and 19 says, they shall serve strangers in a land that is not theirs. Okay, here's a question. 
Did the Israelites hearing this think this particular scripture was speaking of Egypt? Chances are they didn't. These verses, including Genesis 15 and 13, are clearly speaking of a land outside of the normal migration of Israelites. One can make assumptions as to where, but my money is on the place being America. Now, we have two stipulations that are not supported by an Egyptian captivity. Therefore, we are going to move on to the third stipulation. And this stipulation is the most important, in my opinion, because one, it is where most of the points of contention is coming from. And two, there is a definite number given that cannot be denied or misunderstood. So here it is. Genesis chapter 15, at the end of the verse, 13. And they shall afflict them 400 years. Now, according to this stipulation, the time of affliction would last for 400 years. So just to be clear and precise, let's see what a few definitions of the word afflict or affliction means, just so we can cover all points for the sake of edification. The strong concordance Hebrew word for afflict is ana, a primitive root, possibly rather identical with the Hebrew 6030, through the idea of looking down or browbeating, to depress literally or figuratively, transitively or intransitively, in various applications, seeing is by mistake for the Hebrew 6030, a base self afflict, answering by mistake for the Hebrew 6030, chasten self, deal hardly with, defile, exercise, force, gentleness, humble self, hurt, ravish, sing by mistake. For Hebrew 6030, speak by mistake for Hebrew 6030, submit self, weaken in any wise. Okay, so that's the strong definition. Next, we're going to get the Browns Drivers Briggs. Okay, in the Browns Drivers Briggs definition, the Hebrew word ana. One, to be occupied be bruised with, to afflict, oppress, humble, be afflicted, be bowed down, to put down, become low, to be depressed, be downcast, to be afflicted, to stoop, to humble oneself, bow down, to be afflicted, be humbled, to humble, mishandle, afflict, to humble, be humiliated, to afflict, to humble, weaken oneself, to be afflicted, to humble, to afflict. So that's the Brown Drivers Briggs definition of afflict. Also, it says to humble oneself. All right, now let's get the Webster's Dictionary understanding of afflict. Okay, so the Webster's Dictionary's Definition of afflict means one, to give the body or mind pain, which is continued of some permanence, to grieve or distress as one is afflicted with a gout or with melancholy or with losses and misfortune. They afflict thy heritage, O Lord. Psalms 95 reference. And two, to trouble and to harass, and to distress. So that's the Webster's Dictionary's definition of afflict. Based off of these definitions of affliction or afflict, we see this includes physical as well as mental harm and distress. This is just to clear some things up because some people seem to think affliction is just slavery. So in this stipulation, 
we're going to do several comparisons of scriptures and extra biblical sources to get the full sojourning of the Israelites in the land of Egypt. So I'm going to start with the number of years Israel was in Egypt because there are different accounts as to how long they were there. And if or not the entire sojourning was in the land of Egypt, there also seems to be a misunderstanding of what sojourning means. So I'm going to get the definition of sojourning first, then I'm going to go into the comparisons of the scriptures. So the Webster Dictionary's definition of sojourning says the act of dwelling in a place for a time, also the time of bold. And it has Exodus 12 as reference. Now, this definition is from dictionary.com. And it says, one, a temporary stay. And two, to stay for a time in a place or live temporarily. Okay, so those are the two definitions we have for sojourn or sojourning. So according to these two definitions of sojourning, we see it simply tells us one stayed in a place, not how long or the events that happened while one was there or how long they were afflicted in that place. This is really a matter of reading comprehension. If one is reading a particular part of scripture and seeing no regard to a time of affliction, yet stating it based on the sojourning, again, it is a lack of attention to detail and poor reading comprehension on their part. So let's get the full sojourning of the Israelites in the land of Egypt. From the King James Virgin Bible, Exodus chapter 12, verse 40 to verse 41. Now, the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the self same day, it came to pass that all the hosts of the Most High went out from the land of Egypt. All right. So in the King James Version Bible, Exodus 12 and 40 says, the full sojourning of the children of Israel in Egypt was 430 years. End of story, right? No. We have to remember, the sojourning is not the amount of time they were afflicted. Also, there is scripture in Galatians chapter 3, verse 17, that says something that will cause those who pay attention to what they read to question the time frame of affliction in Egypt. From the King James Version Bible, Galatians chapter 3, verse 17. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before the Most High in Mashiach, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. One thing I noticed immediately when I read this verse is that it says the law came 430 years after the covenant. So I asked myself, according to scripture, what law and what covenant? Then I instantly remembered the covenant the Most High made with Abraham. This is how I knew I was called to do this particular task, because though I did not have enough information to say it, I told a brother that this verse is telling us that the 430 years of Israel's sojourning began when the Most High made the covenant with Abraham. All praises to the Most High. He confirmed it by sending me the information which I am going to show you now. From the Targums of Ankylos, page 479, second paragraph. In the days of the dwelling of the sons of Israel in Mizraim were 30 weeks of years, 30 times seven years, which is the sum of 210 years. But the number of 430 years had passed away since the Most High spake to Abraham 
in the hour that he spake with him on the 15th of Nisan. This is just one witness that confirms that the Israelites did not spend the entire duration of the 430 years in Egypt. We are now going to take a look at the Greek Septuagint, which is translated from an older copy of the Hebrew, because it speaks on the exact place of the sojourning of Israel within the stint of the 430 years. From the Greek Septuagint, Exodus chapter 12, verse 40 to verse 41. And the sojourning of the children of Israel while they sojourned in the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan was 430 years. And it came to pass after the 430 years, all the forces of the Most High came forth out of the land of Egypt by night. All right, so according to the Greek Septuagint, the 430 years of the Israelite sojourning was spent in both the land of Egypt and Canaan. The scriptures testify that at the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. But for the sake of edification, I'm going to give two more witnesses that confirm that the Israelites were not sojourning in Egypt a full 430 years but were there no more than 215 years. The works of Josephus, Antiquities of the Jews, Book 2, Chapter 15, Paragraph 2. They left Egypt in the month of Xanticus on the 15th day of the lunar month, 430 years after our forefather Abraham came into Canaan, but 215 years only after Jacob removed into Egypt. Now, to some, Josephus may not be as good a source as others. The point of using Josephus is to understand that though there are disagreements between the witnesses on some topics, all three agree on this point that the full sojourning of the Israelites was spent in both Egypt and Canaan. And the fact that the sources disagree on some matters and not all shows there is little to no bias in the information. Nevertheless, Josephus states 215 years were spent in Canaan before Jacob came into Egypt. And we know Jacob was about 130 years old when he came into Egypt. So we should be able to count back 215 years, and it should put us around the time Abraham received the covenant from the Most High. So now we are going to move on to our last witness concerning the sojourning of the Israelites in Egypt and Canaan. The book of Jasher, chapter 81, verse 1 to verse 4. And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot, besides the little ones and their wives. Also, a mixed multitude went up with them, and flocks and herds, even much cattle. And the sojourning of the children of Israel, who dwelt in the land of Egypt in hard labor, was 210 years. And at the end of the 210 years, the Most High brought forth the children of Israel from Egypt with a strong hand. So, what we see is according to the witnesses, the full sojourning of the Israelites in Egypt was no longer than 215 years, and the other half of the 430 years was spent in Canaan. So let's go back to Galatians for my final analysis. From the King James Version Bible, Galatians chapter 3, verse 17. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of the Most High in Mashiach, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. 
what this scripture is saying is that the covenant that the Most High sent Mashiach to safeguard cannot be made void by the law that was given 430 years after. This is why in Leviticus chapter 26 and 44 to 45, the Most High says this from the King James Version Bible. Leviticus chapter 26, verse 44 to 45. And yet for all that, when they be in the land of their enemies, will I not cast them away? Neither will I abhor them to destroy them utterly and to break my covenant with them. For I am the most high, their Allah But I will for their sake, Remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the heathen, that I might be their Allah. I am the Most High. Now that we have that out of the way, we can get to the main point of contention, which is, if or not the 400 years of affliction happened in Egypt, we needed to know how long Israel was in the land of Egypt. And again, what we have learned is it was no more than 215 years. We also need to know when the affliction started and when the affliction ended. Now, remember, we have a space of 215 years left in Egypt for 400 years of affliction to happen which is mathematically impossible. So I'm going to go by the logic of those who say the Israelites were afflicted in Egypt 400 years and start the 430 years of sojourning at the point when all the Israelites came into Egypt, just to show that even by their own logic, it is mathematically impossible. So, what we know is Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before the Pharaoh. We can find this in Genesis chapter 41, verse 45 to 46. From the King James Virgin Bible, Genesis chapter 41, verse 45. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name, Zaphnath Paneah, and he gave him to wife, Asenath the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On. And Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. And Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. Okay, what else do we know? Well, we also know that they had seven years of abundance in two years of famine before Jacob and all of Joseph's brethren and relatives came to live in Egypt. From the King James Version Bible, Genesis chapter 41, verse 28 to 29. This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. What the Most High is about to do, he showeth unto Pharaoh. Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. From the King James Version Bible, Genesis chapter 47, verse 18. When that year was ended, they came unto him the second year and said unto him, We will not hide it from my Lord, how that our money is spent. My Lord also have our herds of cattle. There is not aught left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our land. Wherefore shall we die before thy eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for bread, and we and our land will be servants unto Pharaoh, and give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land be not desolate. All right. So according to these scriptures, Joseph would have been at least 39 years of age when Jacob and his brethren came into the land of Egypt to sojourn. Remember the age 39. Now, we need to find out how long Joseph lived. This is because the affliction did not happen until after Joseph 
and all his brethren and all that generation died. From the King James Version Bible, Genesis chapter 50, verse 25 to 26. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, The Most High will surely visit you. And ye shall carry up my bones from hence. So Joseph died being a hundred and ten years old. And they embalmed him. And he was put in a coffin in Egypt. From the King James Version Bible. Exodus chapter 1 verse 6. And Joseph died and all his brethren in all that generation. Okay. Now we have the age at which Joseph died, which was 110 years old. But we have to remember that not only did it say Joseph died, but all his brethren in all that generation. This tells us that the afflictions didn't happen right after Joseph died. But according to the scripture, the affliction started around the time of Moses' birth. From the King James Version Bible. Exodus chapter 1, verse 8 to verse 11. Now there rose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us. And so get them up out of the land. Therefore, they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pithom and Ramses. So we can see the affliction started when a new king arose in Egypt that knew not Joseph. But when did this king arise? These next verses from Acts chapter 7 verse 17 will give us a little bit more of a time frame of when this began to happen as it will show the time of the affliction started around the same time of Moses' birth. From the King James Virgin Bible, Acts chapter 7 verse 17. But when the time of the promise drew nigh, which the Most High has sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose, which knew not Joseph. The same dealt subtly with our kindred, and evil entreated our fathers, so that they cast out their young children, to the end that they might not live, in which time Moses was born, and was exceeding fair, and nourished up in his father's house three months. Great. So we have that understanding. Now, let's take a moment to do the math. And I'm going to do this according to the understanding of those who believe Egypt was the place of the 400 years of affliction first. Now, Joseph was 39 years old when his father and brethren came into the land of Egypt. And Joseph was 110 years old when he died. So, I'm going to subtract 39 from 110 in order to get the number of years the Israelites were in Egypt before they begin to be afflicted. So, 110 minus 39 equals 71. Now, we must subtract 71 from 430 to get the number of years the Israelites were afflicted in Egypt. So, 430 minus 71 equals 359 years left to be afflicted in Egypt. Now, again, this is the understanding of those people saying that the 400 years of affliction happened in Egypt. But according to what the scriptures say, we can see that is impossible. So now, Listen carefully to what I'm going to say. The Most High said 400 years of affliction. That is what it would be. I want you all to keep in mind 
that I didn't use the fact that the afflictions didn't start until around the time Moses was born or the fact that the full sojourning of the Israelites in Egypt was only 215 years. I left it out to show that even with the base knowledge, the 400 years of affliction in Egypt could be disproven. Okay, so now let's get the actual time the Israelites could have spent in Egypt under affliction. Remember, the actual amount of time they sojourned in Egypt was 215 years. So we are going to use the same numbers, but instead of 430 years, we are going to subtract 71, which is the amount of years passed before the Israelites begin to be afflicted from 215, which again is the actual time of sojourning. So 215 minus 71 equals 144. And let's not forget that the afflictions didn't start until around the time of Moses' birth. And Moses was 80 years old when he left Egypt. So we have to subtract 80 from 144 to find out how many years passed from Joseph's death to Moses' birth. So 144 minus 80 equals 64. So we have almost 64 more years after Joseph's death before the Israelites begin to be afflicted in Egypt which means the time of affliction in Egypt was less than 144 years. I could end this lesson here, and it would be sound enough to hold up to much scrutiny. But as I said in the introduction, this lesson is going to be an in-depth teaching. And anyone who believes the 400-year prophecy that watches this lesson will be able to defend their belief based on the facts and not any dates or assumptions. Okay, let's move on to the next stipulation. This stipulation is one that only a blind person could not see. The judgment, and so it goes. Genesis chapter 15, verse 14. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. So, here's a question. What does judgment look like? What did the Most High do to those kingdoms preceding America when they took Israel captive? Were they not destroyed? How does the Most High say our deliverance from this kingdom will look? From the King James Version Bible, Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 33 to 36. As I live, said the Most High Allah Surely with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out will I rule over you and I will bring you out from the people and will gather you out of the countries wherein ye are scattered with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out and I will bring you into the wilderness of the people and there will I plead with you face to face like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of Egypt, so will I plead with you, saith the Most High, Allah Hayyim. From the Apocrypha, 2nd Edges, chapter 16, verse 1 to 5. Woe be unto thee, Babylon in Asia. Woe be unto thee, Egypt in Syria. Gird up yourselves with cloth of sack and hair, Bewail your children and be sorry, for your destruction is at hand. A sword is sent upon you, and who may turn it back? A fire is sent among you, and who may quench it? Plagues are sent unto you, and what is he that may drive them away? With a mighty hand and stretched out arms. This is the type of language used to describe the plagues that destroyed Egypt. We can also see that there is no new thing under the sun. The same way the Most High pleaded with our forefathers in the wilderness of Egypt would be the same way he pleads with us in the wilderness. This notion that those who believe in the 400-year prophecy think it is the return of Mashiach is absolute hogwash. 
No one in any video said that the 400th year would mark the return of Mashiach or mark the end of the so-called world. But according to what is written, it is a time when the curses will begin to be lifted off of us and put on our enemies. These things will coincide with our repentance, our gathering, and the Most High's accepting us again as his people. This information was covered in depth on the second Exodus plagues video. From the King James Version Bible, Isaiah chapter 51, verse 21 to 23. Therefore, hear now this, thou afflicted and drunken, but not with wine. Thus saith thy master, the Most High, and thy Elohim, that pleadeth the cause of his people. Behold, I have taken out of thy hand the cup of trembling, even the dregs of the cup of my fury. Thou should no more drink it again, but I will put it into the hand of them that afflict thee, which have said to thy soul, bow down that we may go over. And thou hast laid thy body as the ground and as the streets to them that went over. From the King James Version Bible, Joel chapter 3, verse 7. Behold, I will raise them out of the place whither ye have sold them, and I will return your recompense upon your own head. Any Israelite who doesn't believe that we are currently being afflicted needs to explain these verses. Hear now thou afflicted and drunken, but not with wine. This is Israel. This is us. We have been afflicted for close to 400 years. We have been in a strange land for close to 400 years. We have served our enemies in a land that is not ours for close to 400 years. Yet the Most High says that same cup we drank from will be removed from our hands and put into the hands of them that afflict us. So when you hear Israelites who believe the 400-year prophecy speaking of the end of the curses and the plagues coming on our enemies, they are 100% correct. The Most High says he will return their recompense upon their own head. The major difference between this place being judged and Egypt's judgment is the amount of plagues that will befall this place. As it is written in the Targums, this current kingdom faces 250 plagues, and this is a translation of Genesis chapter 15, verse 12 through 14. The Targums of Ankylos, Genesis chapter 15, verse 12 to 14. And when the sun was nearing to set, a deep sleep was thrown upon Abraham, and behold, Four kingdoms arose to enslave his children, Terah, which is Babel, Darkness, which is Madai, Greatness, which is Javan, Decline, which is Ferris, which is to fall and to have no uplifting, and from whence it is to be that the children of Israel will come up. And he said unto Abraham, Knowing thou must know, that thy son shall dwell in a land not their own, because thou hast not believed, and they will subjugate and afflict them four hundred years, and also the people whom they shall serve. I will judge with two hundred and fifty plagues, and afterwards they shall go forth into liberty with great riches." 250 plagues according to the Targums Genesis 15 and 12 to 14 prophecy given unto Abraham. In the KJV Bible, no place was given and no plague or amount of plagues was given. So the Targum offers a unique understanding and it makes sense too. When one considers the amount of plagues or curses we currently see happening today, how many plagues was Egypt hit with? Wasn't Egypt hit with 10 plagues? So the Targum definitely doesn't agree with the 400 years of affliction in Egypt, nor was Egypt even mentioned concerning the kingdoms that Israel would serve under. So let's take a look at another witness 
as to the time of the 400 years of affliction and see when they believe this judgment is to come. The Apocalypse of Abraham, chapter 32, verse 1 to 6. From the Apocalypse of Abraham, chapter 32, starting at verse 1, going to verse 6. Therefore, hear Abraham and see, behold, your seventh generation should go with you, and they will go out into an alien land, and they will enslave them and oppress them as for one hour of the impious age. But of that nation whom they shall serve, I am the judge. And the Most High said this too. Have you heard, Abraham, what I told you, what your tribe will encounter in the last days? Abraham, having heard, accepted the word of the Most High in his heart. So, what we see concerning the prophecy spoken unto Abraham by the Most High is that these events that the Most High was telling Abraham about would be happening in the last days. You know, this is nothing new as to how the Most High deals with those who are enemies of the children of Israel. Anyone paying attention to the events as they unfold and reading the scriptures will surely see the decline of this current kingdom via war, famine, earthquakes, storms, civil unrest, financial ruin and disease. Seeing that this is the final kingdom and how great or powerful it is, thus the fall of it will be harder than all the others and it never will rise again. From the King James Version Bible, Deuteronomy chapter four, verse 33 to 34. Did ever a people hear the voice of the Most High speaking out of the midst of the fire as thou hast heard and live? Or hath the Most High essayed to go and take him a nation from the midst of another nation by temptations, by signs, by wonders, and by war, and by a mighty hand, and by a stretched out arm, and by great terrors, according to all that the Most High, your Allah Hayim, did for you in Egypt? Before your eyes. Again, I ask, what are the things we see happening in this kingdom? Do we not see wars, temptations, wonders, and signs? We are witnessing the Most High's mighty hand begin to move on this nation. But just like our forefathers seen and did not believe, there are those with stiff necks now seeing and still not believing. So let's move on to the final stipulation. Genesis chapter 15, verse 14. And afterward shall they come out with great substance. Notice the word afterwards. This tells us a few things. First and foremost, it tells us no one is leaving until after the judgment. This also tells us we should be paying close attention to the events surrounding the judgment. But a person that has no understanding of what this prophecy is saying will equate it to the end. These same people expose their own lack of understanding of what the scriptures say concerning our deliverance. Assuming that those who believe the prophecy is speaking of now somehow believe that Mashiach is to return after 400 years. Why? Because these same people think that Mashiach is supposed to come to America to destroy it. But let's talk about great substance. What does it mean? How much is great substance? Let's just take a quick look to see what great substance means. Okay, so for substance in the Strong's Concordance, you can find it under the Hebrew 7399. The word is rakush. And it says from passive participle of Hebrew 7408 property as gathered good riches substance. Okay, now the Browns Drivers Briggs also has it in the Hebrew 7399, and it's also uh, says Rakush. And the definition says one property, good possession. And then it says in the 1A and 1A2, it says general term for all movable goods, 
of livestock, and it says of stores, utensils, etc. All right. So what we see according to the Strong's Concordance in the Brown's Driver's Briggs Dictionary is that great substance simply means great possessions. I don't know if we will be leaving with fiat currency or if it would even be useful where we would be going. What we do know is that every kingdom that the Israelites were captive to gave them some form of payment when they were released. Yet none of those kingdoms were to face the same level of wrath as this current kingdom. This kingdom is not exempt from the things that those kingdoms preceded it faced. But as it is written, this kingdom will pay double for what it has done. From the King James Virgin Bible, Revelations chapter 18, verse 6 to verse 8. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and pay her double according to her works. In the cup which she has given thee to drink, give her double. As much as she has glorified herself and lived deliciously, give her that much torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit a queen, and I am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore, shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burnt with fire. For strong is the Most High who judges her. As I stated before, never has Israel left a captivity empty-handed. And reflecting back to what the scriptures say, there would be restitution, restoration, and reparations for the Most High's people. From the King James Virgin Bible, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 16 to 17. Therefore, all they that devour thee shall be devoured, and all thy adversaries every one of them shall go into captivity and they that spoil thee shall be a spoil and all that prey upon thee will I give for a prey for I will restore health unto thee and I will heal thee of thy wounds saith the most high because they called thee an outcast saying this is Zion who no man seeketh after so now after this study Anyone can see what the truth is according to what is written and not according to any dates, not according to any assumptions, but according to thus saith the Most High. I have shown each stipulation and I have shown the flawed thinking of the 400 years of affliction in Egypt. I have presented several witnesses and the verdict is out. Through process of elimination, the 400 years of prophecy spoken unto Abraham by the Most High is speaking of this current captivity. Now, unlike many of the scoffers who refuse to do an in-depth presentation answering the points of contention, I'm going to answer some of the things said by others in the attempt to try to deny that the 400 years of affliction is speaking of this current captivity. I want to show you some pictures and some video clips. Look at this. They gave us this because they wanted us to think Mashiach was a so-called white man. They gave this to us so that we would see them as gods. What was the purpose of this picture? The purpose was so that we would see them as Noah. Look at this picture of Cecil D. DeMille's movie, The Ten Commandments. This was to make us believe the people in the Bible look like them. Look at this clip. Joshua! 400 years in bondage, and today he won't move. They wanted us to think 400 years of affliction happened in Egypt. Look, they showed us this because they wanted us to believe Moses looked like this. And look at what it says in the beginning credits of this movie. Again, 
They wanted us to think the 400 years of affliction happened in Egypt. These pictures and videos are examples of how the enemy promotes their lies and their doctrines by using pictures that have their faces to make the world believe they are us. Before I ever read the Bible, I saw the movie The Ten Commandments with Charleston Heston standing on a mountain as Moses. These images were made to deceive us. When we come into the understanding of who we are, we are taught to question everything the enemy gave us. Yet brothers are holding to a doctrine that the enemy has clearly pushed by the means of their false images and storytelling filled with lies. Many brothers and sisters still believe our people were afflicted 400 years in Egypt. As the racist Christian apologist Vocat Malone also believes. I don't know about y'all, but if I believe the same as Vocat Malone on anything, I'm going to go back and research it again and make sure because that dude is a straight enemy to our people. He is an enemy to the Most High and he is against our awakening. I'll address him in a moment though. But first, I'll address some of the strong man arguments brothers are using to deny what is being said. Again, these are strong man arguments because they do not address the issue and the differences we are seeing concerning the 400 year prophecy. One, we got brothers who claim to have scholarly level understanding saying no man know of the time. First off, that type of thinking is stupid and contradicts the fact that the Most High told Abraham his seed would be afflicted 400 years. Last time I checked, Abraham was a man. This private interpretation goes against the scripture. And brothers are taking a scripture speaking about Mashiach's return and applying it to this prophecy that is not speaking in the context of Mashiach's return. In the attempt to negate this prophecy that the Most High clearly spoke on to inform us. So let's take a look and see what these scriptures are talking about. From the King James Virgin Bible, Matthews chapter 24, verse 29 to 39. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now learn the parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves, ye know the summer is not. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of no were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took all the way. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So what is this saying? Because the subtitle within Matthew's chapter 24 clearly says the coming of the Son of Man, which is concerning Mashiach's return and not the 400-year prophecy or any other for that matter. So let's take a look at another one because we are not going to leave any stone unturned. From the King James Virgin Bible, Mark chapter 13, verse 32 to 36. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, 
No, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at evening, or at midnight, or at the cock crow, or in the morning. Lest cometh suddenly he find you sleeping. Now, in Mark chapter 13, again, the subtitle says, The Coming of the Son of Man. It is strange to hear brothers continually use this scripture as an excuse to say we should not be speaking on the 400-year prophecy. I mean, these brothers who have taken up titles and positions of elders, teachers, and leaders, yet they are using tactics that Christians with no biblical prowess would use. Nevertheless, to close the door on this foolish attempt to negate the true understanding of the 400-year prophecy, let's get it again. No man knows one more time. From the King James Virgin Bible, Acts chapter 1, verse 6 to 7. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Master, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Now I have a question. Is the kingdom supposed to be restored when Mashiach comes, or is it supposed to be restored while we are in America and abroad? Again, this scripture is not speaking in the context of the 400 years spoken unto Abraham. It is once again speaking in a time frame of which Mashiach will return and restore the kingdom. I am not buying that brothers who have taught for over 10 to 12 years or more cannot see this. Somebody is lying. I do not believe brothers are actually teaching and cannot grasp the simple understanding of the context of what the scripture is speaking of when it says no man nor of the time. The Most High is not the author of confusion, and the scriptures rightly divided does not contradict itself. For example, from the King James Version Bible, Romans chapter 15, verse 4, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. So, Self-proclaimed elders, chiefs, and teachers are telling brothers and sisters who read that Abraham's seed would go through 400 years of affliction to get off of it, and that no man know of the time according to their false interpretation of what that scripture says. Yet Romans chapter 15 and 4 says that the things that are written are for us to learn in order for us to have hope, precept upon precept line upon line, and it says, from the King James Virgin Bible, Romans chapter 3, verse 1 to 2, what advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of the Most High. Listen, I love my people, but I'm not going to give up my advantage that the Most High gave me just because brother's false doctrine and love of America is in jeopardy. I'm not here to be a man pleaser. I'm not here to tell people what they want to hear or to believe a person based on their title. I most definitely am not going to let someone convince me that the scriptures didn't say the Israelites would go through 400 years of affliction when it is written in Genesis 15 and 13. How many times are we going to hear the strong man arguments without anyone addressing the issues? So brothers are now saying 
What about the scattered Israelites? What about those in other countries? Question. Did the transatlantic slave trade happen to all Israelites? No, it didn't. This tells you that all scriptures do not always pertain to all Israel. Furthermore, the scriptures are clear that the focal point of deliverance will be first from America, then from all the other places where Israelites were scattered. From the King James Version Bible, Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 7 to 8. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Most High, that they should no more say, the Most High liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Most High liveth, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country and from all countries whither I had driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. This scripture tells us there would be an exodus from the north country and from all the other countries where we were scattered. Notice the north country is mentioned first. This is because it is the focal point or start from which the exodus will begin. Again, it says, from the King James Version Bible, Jeremiah chapter 16, verse 14 to 15. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Most High, that it shall no more be said, the Most High liveth that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Most High liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands whither he had driven them. And I will bring them again into their land that I gave unto their fathers. Once again, it says from the land of the north and from all the lands whither he scattered us and meaning also, but the land of the north was the only one specified. The other lands were not specified in this verse, showing that the land of the north was the focal point of the verse. The first ones to be saved would be the southern kingdom. Where are the majority of the southern kingdom? The scriptures tell us. From the King James Virgin Bible, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 7. The Most High also shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. This scripture testifies that Judah will be saved first. To be exact, the southern kingdom will be the first to go into the wilderness. Sound understanding tells us that deliverance is not going to be an instantaneous thing, but will be a gradual event, which will be sparked by the largest exodus ever out of America. From the war scrolls, the opposing forces are equally matched, and only by the intervention of the mighty hand of the Most High is the balance between them to be disturbed when he deals an everlasting blow to Belial and all the host of his kingdom. For the master, the rule of war on the unleashing of the attack of the sons of light against the companies of the sons of darkness, the army of Belial, against the band of Edom, Moab, and the sons of Ammon, and against the army of the sons of the east and the Philistines, and against the bands of Kittim, of Assyria, and their allies, the ungodly of the covenant, the sons of Levi, Judah, and Benjamin, the exile in the desert, shall battle against them in all their bands when the exiled sons of light return from the desert of the people to camp in the desert of Jerusalem. And after the battle, they should go up from there to Jerusalem. The king of Kittim shall enter into Egypt, and in his time he shall set out a great wrath to wage war against the kings 
of the north, that his fury may destroy and cut the horn of Israel. This should be a time of salvation for the people of the Most High, an age of dominion for all the members of his company, and an everlasting destruction for all the companies of Belial. So according to the Dead Sea Scrolls, Benjamin, Judah, and Levi would be the ones to fight in the desert against the nations that opposed Israel. They will be equally matched until something happens that will cause the balance to be turned in their favor. My belief is that Mashiach's return will upset the balance tempered in our favor. These war scrolls describe the events to take place after we have left America, at which point we will have renewed our covenant with the Most High and are under his protection as it will clearly be demonstrated at that point. Okay. So, there is also another issue. Brothers are claiming that the prophecy started with Isaac's birth and that the 430 years begin when Isaac was afflicted. Now, there are obvious holes in this argument. Just the fact that Isaac is one person and he did not live until the time when the Israelites entered Egypt. But we're going to look at the scriptures concerning the prophecy and see does Ishmael persecuting Isaac fit the prophecy? I believe this is another case of poor reading comprehension, understanding the difference between a plural noun, them, they, their, and singular, him, he, she, her. What does the scripture say? Let's get a few precepts and find out. From the King James Version Bible, Genesis chapter 15, verse 13. And he said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and they shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. Hold up. Is this speaking about one person, Isaac? Or is this speaking about more than one person? Thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they. Wait a minute. Was Ishmael a nation when Isaac was alive? No. Okay. Let's continue. And they shall afflict them, plural, not him, which is singular, 400 years. So, how are scholarly level teachers not understanding basic grammar and applying a prophecy concerning Israel as a nation to the one individual, Isaac? This is bad and very disconcerting because not even a novice would make these type of mistakes. But again, these are elders and teachers who have had these titles and platforms to teach over 10 to 12 years or more. Precept upon precept, line upon line. Let's get another witness because the scriptures testify to the prophecy being about us today. From the King James Version Bible, Acts chapter 7, verse 6. And the Most High spake on this wise, that his seed should sojourn in a strange land and that they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil 400 years. Now, in this verse, we have all the same indications of the prophecy having to do with Israel as a nation and not just Isaac and Ishmael. Also, this scripture testifies to the fact that the nation Israelites will be afflicted by will bring them into bondage. And we know Egyptians did not bring Israelites into bondage. Israelites were already dwelling there when they decided to afflict them. Question, was Isaac brought into bondage by Ishmael or any other nation? No, he was not. So this understanding that Isaac was the seed the prophecy was speaking of is completely false and it still doesn't answer the issue of the time of affliction because according to the scripture and not some ridiculous rant without biblical proof, there was a time when Egyptians began to afflict Israel as it was written 
Thus, there was a time when they were not being afflicted. Yet, because some brothers are so quick to try to speak and not listen, learn, and understand what is being said, this fact goes directly over their heads. From the King James Version Bible, Exodus chapter 1, verse 8 to 11. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. Therefore, they did set over them taskmaster to afflict them with their burden, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pithom and Ramses. From the King James Virgin Bible, Acts chapter 7, verse 17 to 19. But when the time of the promise drew nigh, which the Most High had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose, which knew not Joseph. The same dealt subtly with our kindred, and evil entreated our fathers, so that they cast out their young children to the end they might not live. The Book of Jubilees, chapter 46, paragraph 1. And it came to pass that after Jacob died, the children of Israel multiplied in the land of Egypt, and they became a great nation, and they were of one accord in heart, so that brother loved brother, and every man helped his brother, and they increased abundantly and multiplied exceedingly. Ten weeks of years, all the days of the life of Joseph, and there was no Satan nor any evil all the days of the life of Joseph, which he lived after his father Jacob. For all the Egyptians honored the children of Israel all the days of the life of Joseph. So, according to Jubilees chapter 46, the Egyptians honored the children of Israel all the days of the life of Joseph, which the Bible also confirms. But what's even more interesting is that the chapter in Jubilee says there was no Satan, meaning adversary. So there was most definitely a time where there was no affliction happening to the children of Israel. You know, the beautiful thing about the truth is it doesn't change. You can change a lie a million times and the truth will expose the lie. Why do I say that? Well, the scriptures reveal that even if you are foolish enough to claim the affliction started with Isaac, there still isn't 400 years worth of affliction, seeing there was a time period where not only was the children of Israel living in Egypt in peace, but also being honored among the Egyptians all the days Joseph lived, which means you still subtract 71 from the time of Isaac's birth. So let's do this again. 430 minus 71 equals 359. Anyone can do the math and see 400 years of affliction was not accomplished in Egypt or by anyone according to what is written. I have one more thing to address with brothers. I'm not going to mention any names because of my love and respect for our nation and my appreciation for the past works brothers have done. But I'm going to say that you brothers out here doing what I'm about to address have better repent because the way you are going about it is prideful and stubborn. So brothers that have seen the evidence and realized 400 years of affliction could not have happened in Egypt are omitting Genesis chapter 15 and 13. Brothers are saying that the Most High did not say 400 years because they cannot find the affliction happening in Egypt. Brothers are calling the Most High a liar and claiming that the 400 years of affliction 
was planted in our heads by the enemy. So we would say we are the seed of which the prophecy is spoken of. Now, first off, the enemy has never had any major push by media or anything else to acknowledge our afflictions and who we are. There is an agenda behind their denial. You brothers who are teachers saying there is no 400 year prophecy had better have a quick change of heart given the things we see happening around us today. Brothers and sisters learning from these brothers need to have their Bibles open and reading when you learn from them and taking notes and going back and studying yourself or else you are in the same mindset as when you claim the religion and not your heritage. I don't care how long brothers been teaching or how many people or views they get on their channel, omitting scripture is going to lead down a dangerous road of non-belief and man worship. Listen, our minds is created to be able to discern the scriptures. Second Timothy 1 and 7 says, for the most high has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That's right. The most high gave us a sound mind and it is needed when it comes to reasoning with each other concerning scripture. This is very important. So let's talk about a sound mind. What does it mean to have a sound mind? Why is it important to have a sound mind. Let's get the definition. So the strong concordance in this pronounced sophronismus from the Greek 4994, discipline, that is self-control, a sound mind. Now, the business dictionary has a more broader understanding and it says, legally, having the capacity to think, reason, and understand for oneself. Adults by nature are considered in general to be in sound mind, but through certain circumstances can be rendered as being not in sound mind due to intensive brain damage or other major incapacities, sound mind, is considered a legal requirement before writing or singing most legal documents, including a will. Okay, so what we see according to these two definitions is that having a sound mind includes discipline and self-control. According to the business dictionary, these attributes are displayed by those who are adults by nature and mature in their thinking. It also means having the capacity to think, reason, and understand for oneself. Why is this important, you may ask? Well, if one finds out that the 400 years of affliction could not have happened in Egypt, a sound mind would lead one to reason, where could it have happened? That is a sound mind given by the Most High. A sound mind given by the Most High would not cause a person to throw out scripture because it does not fit their doctrine or understanding, but it would cause one with a sound mind to gather information and come to a conclusion based on the evidence, not dismiss the information despite the evidence. A man or woman of the Most High should never omit scripture but find a clear line of understanding to be edified and to edify others. The sound mind that the Most High has given me led me to know and understand that the 400-year prophecy is speaking of us today. In times that I doubt it, the Most High confirmed what was true with scripture and information. At times when I asked, Am I on the right track? The Most High sent more and more people who came to the same conclusion I did. Some may not accept the Targum's translation, but I would tell you, it is one part in a long line of witnesses. The Targums of Ankylos, Genesis account, Palestine, 
translation. Genesis chapter 15, verse 12 through 14. And when the sun was nearing to set, a deep sleep was thrown upon Abraham. And behold, four kingdoms arose to enslave his children. Terror, which is Babel, darkness, which is Madai, greatness, which is Javan, decline, which is Ferris, which is to fall and to have no uplifting, and from whence it is to be that the children of Israel will come up. And he said to Abraham, knowing thou must know that thy son shall dwell in a land not their own, because thou hast not believed, and they will subjugate and afflict them 400 years, and also that the people whom they shall serve, I will judge with 250 plagues, and afterwards they shall go forth into liberty with great riches. From the Targums of Ankelos, Genesis account, Jerusalem translation, Genesis chapter 15, verse 12. And when the sun was going to set, a sleep profound and sweet fell upon Abraham. And behold, Abraham saw four kingdoms which should arise to bring his sons into subjection. And terror, the greatness of darkness, fell upon them. Terror, that is Babel. Darkness, that is Madai. Greatness, that is Greece. Fell, that is Edom, Rome, that fourth kingdom, which is to fall and never to rise again forever and ever. This translation seemed to be very profound because according to the Targums, when the Most High spoke to Abraham about the 400 years of captivity, he also revealed the same information that was revealed to Daniel. The four beasts or the kingdoms and the understanding that the last beast will fall and never rise again. But one thing you will find in the scriptures, no matter what the translation is, is that they all say that the afflictions will last for 400 years. But they also exclude Egypt from being mentioned. So whoever translated these scriptures, whether they be the KJV, the Targums, or the Septuagint, they do not say the afflictions will happen in Egypt. Brothers and sisters who have an issue with people saying this kingdom is the place of the 400-year prophecy really need to examine the interpretation of Genesis chapter 15. Is it according to the many scriptural references, or is it according to a doctrine passed down years before you knew you was an Israelite? Let the Most High be true, and every man a liar. I will continue to believe what he has said. My suggestion to all Israel is that they do the same. Now, this one more short issue, and I'm not going to take much time on it. Look at this guy. His name is Vocab Malone. This guy has put forth a concerted effort to demonize and discredit our people. He is without a doubt a full-fledged enemy of Israelites and the awakening. He is willing to lie, twist scripture, and use false narratives to promote a negative view of so-called black people who come into the understanding that they are Israelites. He is a part of an agenda that would eventually usher in the mass murder of our people. The tactics being used are the same ones Hitler used to get people to accept killing other people as a norm. He has continually accused our people of being violent, while at the same time discoursing with various Israelites without fear of harm to himself. He and other hateful Christians continually push the narrative that we are a hate group or cult filled with criminals. They do this to promote our slaughter. This fraud has recently fixed his gaze on the 400-year prophecy. He hasn't presented any lessons discussing the detail of much other than that he believes that Egypt is the place of the 400 years of affliction. He mainly just scoffs at the idea. But it is not a topic 
that he has gone in depth on to look at the stipulations of the prophecy. So why? Why the sudden interest in Israelites in the 400-year prophecy? Why choose to try and discredit the understanding, yet not give any direct lessons or scriptures to refute our claims? The answer is simple. Because the knowledge of this prophecy not happening in Egypt opens up a can of worms that Volcat Malone has been tasked with keeping under wraps. What can of worms? The can of worms that will lead people to ask the critical questions. If Israelites were not afflicted in Egypt 400 years, when and where did it happen? Throughout history, up until now, there are only one people, one event that fits the prophecy of the 400 years of affliction in an unknown land. Nothing else comes close. Yet that is not all. But the people propped up before the world to be Israel do not fit that prophecy and would also be exposed as liars. So this presentation is of the utmost importance. It is for us to know and for us to declare that we are the people of this prophecy, that we are the children of Israel. And as the plagues continue to increase, we must put the information out that the whole world witnessed the Most High do as he said he would do. As for you, Vocab Malone, I have a prayer for you and those who walk in the same path as you, who seek the demise of the Most High's people. From the King James Version Bible, Psalms chapter 50, verse 16 to 21. But unto the wicked, said the Most High, what hast thou to do to declare my statutes, or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth? Seeing thou hatest instructions, and casteth my word behind thee, when thou sawest a thief, then thou consentest with him, and hast been partakers of adulterers. Thou givest thy mouth to evil, and thy tongue frameth deceit. Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother. Thou slanderest thy own mother's son. These things hast thou done, and I kept silent. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such as one as thyself. But I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. All right, yeah. So, hold on, let me. Uh, so let us go. Let us go is correct. Let us and go. We have the same, um, well, let me the information, the scriptures, everybody in here should be saying, "Let us go." Let us I want to say to one or two things. Let us go or let's stay. The same way they only give us two options when it comes to Republicans and Republicans and Democrats, and they say, you know, vote for the lesser of two evils. Let's see where everybody here is at. So I want yeah. the people to say, if they feel, let us go, let us go. They feel, let us stay, let us stay. I want to see what we got here. Let it go or stay. Which one is it? And we should have 200, at least over 200 let us goes. Indeed. The minute we see let us stay, Brother Cleo, please kick that person out. <laughs> I don't mean that. I, I do, but don't kick him out. <laughs> 
Indeed. Be gone, demon. Yeah. <laughs> that was hilarious, though. You know. But the, these, these well, see, two lessons... be unanimous. Indeed. What the scriptures say regarding the 400 years. What the scriptures say regarding Esau or Edom. Where our mind and spirit should be leading into, you know, the coming tribulations or the coming uh, climate within this country. You know, I know everybody's aware of what's going on with, you know, the um, the Ish people and Hamas. Um, I know everybody has noticed the propaganda. You know, but believe it or not, the so-called Palestinians, as we disseminated before, they have to be moved out of the land. And once they are moved out of the land, you know, mainly because of the West and uh, the Ish people, then you're going to see, what is it, the UA, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, what is it, the uh, UAUE, um, United Arab States, United Arab States is going to join together, and they're going to make sure that uh, the Ish people find their way out of the land. You know, the Chaldeans is going to make their move. Now, when this happens, we know that America's time is short after that, because once all the Arab the Arab countries band together and they ally, which looks like they're already aligned with um with Russia and China, America's time will be short after that, and then we'll really get a chance. Who who really believes in the term "we" when we talk about the United States? Some some of us are still saying "we." You know, how, do, do anybody in here find themselves uh, inadvertently saying we when it comes to America? Like we went into Israel. We um, are at beefing with Iraq or I Afghanistan. Or whatever. We, uh, our economy, are, are we still, or we have anybody in here that's still stuck in using the phraseology we when it comes to this country? I mean, some some of us can do it inadvertently. But the thing is, like, spiritually and soon to be physically, we have to separate our minds, our spirits from even being connected with this place because the scriptures say that the Most High is going to, he's going to uh, lay his hands on this nation of Esau by his people Israel. He said, thou, thou art my battle axe and weapons of war. With thee, I will overthrow nations. We got to really be ready to do the things that happens in war. When the Most High is ready to use us, we can't have the we people. Well, what about, I don't, everybody's not, doesn't, some people, we can't have that. You know, so our people have to get into the mindset that we are one people, that we are a nation. And I don't think we look at each other like that. We are a nation of people. You know, if you take you take the Caucasus, you take them anywhere on the earth, they're still a nation. Now I know that they branch themselves out in different places, but they actually are the same people. Whether they stand on Germany, on the land inside Germany, Russia, the UK, uh, Europe, they are still the same people. Whether they land in Canada, they land in Australia, they're still the same people. They can throw whatever name they want on it. You can throw a dress on a man, he's still a man. You can throw the suit on a woman, he's still a woman. So sometimes we allow, you know, the blinders to be put on us. So our people got to really think right now, we're a nation of people. Now, I don't know if anybody's ever read the Covenant of Political and Civil Rights or any human rights treaty where it says every person has a right to a nationality. Every person. And that includes us. Right now, we're not operating in our nationality. I can go out on a limb right now and say, none of you are operating in the name of our forefathers. Right now, you're operating as Esau. You're operating as his descendants. And I say that because we carry on their names. The purpose of a name, last name, is to carry on the name of your fathers. At this point in time, I know some of us have given ourselves Israelite names and we, we, we've taken back uh, um, the scriptures in the sense of saying uh, one shall call himself Jacob and surname himself Israel. We have done that, but a lot of our people haven't. 
a lot of our people just by implication are saying let the heathen live forever you know like when it was said to nebuchadnezzar, nebuchadnezzar let, let the king live forever in a lot of ways we're saying let esau live forever let his name go on to a thousand generations because we still have his tag on us but when we separate ourselves as a nation we understand that we when we say we is talking about us and that touch one touch all that when they're no longer educating our people according to their standards when they're no longer using us to come against our own people because that's one of the main taxes that they use they use us to come against us i don't know if anybody has seen the situation with Deion sanders uh terrell owens stephen a smith and i forget that other brother's name a uh, heavyset brother uh i can't remember his name but those brothers are making it an issue over max kellerman now i know that we're talking about a whole other situation but you got four so-called black men and marcellus wireless wiley who are actually arguing about why stephen a smith got max kellerman fired you're seeing the mental and spiritual shackles on our people yes you're seeing them argue and fight about a, a, a edomite losing his job you're seeing them argue and fight about each other's success each other's position they are the epitome of we when it comes to america and let me tell you something that mindset is why our people still suffer now this are that mindset is why our they will end up broken hearted while we continue to end up broken hearted we're still believing in a people that cannot save so when we put out these precepts it's not unique to us other brothers have brought out these precepts showing that we're the children of israel some believe in 400 years some not i hope hopefully the point has been disseminated to the degree that we are no longer needing of convincing that the 400 years is applied to us i'm hoping that's like a, a issue that if somebody was to come up to you you would say that's preposterous you know this is a known fact that this captivity that this nation is the fourth beast even if a person doesn't understand the bible but the point is, is that we have to separate in every aspect you move uh, what is it uh wise as a serpent harmless as a dove you move and you navigate within this system being who you are coming back to the truth of who you are you operate with wisdom because you're still in, inside this infrastructure but you got to know that you're separate every nation that comes here to make money in this capitalist society understands where they come from they understand that they come from another nation they understand that they want their monies to benefit their people, their children. They're not under the spell of, uh, you know, things like, well, you're a supremacist or you're a racist. One should be a racist, technically. You should look at your race preeminently. Your people should be preeminent to you. You know why? Because if you have children, what person takes and put their children as secondary to another's? What person logically, and I've heard Christians say this, if I had to save my daughter and another person's daughter, I'll try to save them both. No, you tripping. I'm trying to save my daughter. If it come time for either my daughter and my daughter, I'll send flowers. <laughs> Why would I give preeminence to another nation over my own? Why would I deceive myself, lie about myself, lie to my people to believe that I love everybody equally when that's impossible? How can one person love another person's mother other than his own? I'm talking about one of another nation. Of course, you love your mother more than you love any nation on this earth. Of course, you love your father, your children, your aunts, your cousins, your, your friends. You've been deceived to make it look like that's wrong. Because in the end, they want you to turn on your gods, your most high, your creator. You are a racist. The world, the earth is racist. The, when, when people say that white people should allow us to have equal opportunity, why would a nation set up an infrastructure and make another nation equal to himself? We should not be deceived into believing that they should make an infrastructure and make us equal to the point where we can become preeminent over themselves what nation what country what infrastructure what what regime would do such a thing 
but in this country they make it look like it's foolishness of course we're all equal of course we all have um a preeminent love for each other that we would we would uh uh be so colorblind as to not know what our own people looks like that's a trick they pulled on us and we bought it everybody else nobody buys it we love esau to the degree that we would deny salvation think about it. our people would deny salvation for esau well i don't know a god like that my god loves everybody my god won't put one person over the next how many times have we heard that this is your oppressor teaching you this that it's cool when God is choosing him over you, but it's not cool when God chooses you over him. The earth, the earth is sound and beautiful and the waters flow and the oceans are vast and deep and the heavens shine like the brightest lights and the sun falls down at your doorstep and everything is beautiful in a world where you don't have preeminence. You've got to take the blinders off. Not just for the sake of being in the live and looking at a video or having information told to you but you got to take the blinders off to what is real on the earth the chinese view their people as preeminent the koreans the uh india europe uk uh whatever country you see on this surf will if you look at the mexicans you look at the mexicans and i'm talking about mexican boxing for anybody who knows single day mayo you getting you getting cash as a boxer because all the Mexicans are going to support their boxers. It's no doubt, unequivocally they're going to support Canelo Alvarez. They make no qualms about it. Our people are colorblind to a detriment. Nobody else is as colorblind as we are, because nobody else is as blind as we are. So it's not colorblindness that we seem to experience, but blindness. We have ears that we cannot hear, eyes that we cannot see. Now we're trying to disseminate to our people. Wake up. Wake up. It's a blessing to love your own people. Love each other. I'm not talking about in just in word, but I'm talking about in deed. Love each other by standing up for your people. Stop doing goddamn videos and getting in crowds talking about your own people. To other nations and I said God GOT all Israelite camps ain't got no business disrespecting and belittling each other online when we say that another person believes something we leave it open because when you're not going to hear us disrespect our own people not because it's going to end the world that we clash but the spirit is infectious. Negative, negative attention towards each other is infectious. If I say something bad right now about any camp out there, because right now your spirit is moved to agree with what I say, now your spirit is moved against the person I say something against. Now you play hero ball. You jump on right with me and, di and disrespecting or belittling your own people. And guess what? The heathen wins. But if I lift up my people, your spirit being moved to agree with anything I might say right now to Brother Bonya, Brother Clear, Brother Najee, then you'll love your people because it's being put, it's being given to you that way, it's being fed to you that way. You'll see the you'll see the wisdom in it. We have to make it a point to show the nations nobody is more together than we are. When we wasn't together, it's because you tried to break us. You tried to disenfranchise us. You tried to separate us from our heritage. We didn't separate from each other because we hated each other. We separated from each other because you oppressed it out of us. You oppressed our love out of us. Now we show them. Let's now let's put them in great fear and show them that's not the case. We know who you are. This, your, your, your skirt is lift up. Your nakedness is exposed. The white man is not Jaffet. He wasn't made an island of Dr. Moreau. He's not a clone brought down from the Anunnaki. He's Esau. 
the son of Isaac. They sold his promise. He's the end of the world. We're the beginning that follows. So the second exodus is very real. Soon we're going to be doing the second chronology, exposing more of the lies. And I'm saying I'm gonna say this again to the people. If any of the brothers and sisters want to help us with research, if you want to be a part of this work, because you have to bear fruit too. The Mashiach be the root and we be the branches, branches must bear fruit. Bear fruit in the branches of the brothers that you are with right now. As we try to bear fruit, bear fruit with us. We need your help. You can send a memo, an email, a fax, gather information. Let's be together in the restoration of our people. Let's get this work out there that our people wake up that we're on the same page and when we're not on the same page as the, as with a husband and wife as they when they put their children to, to sleep and they decide to rectify their differences in their bedroom at night to each other as it's supposed to be so shall our disagreements be in private amongst us who love us So we want all the people, anybody, send, send us an email if you want to help us with upcoming projects. If you have projects that you believe need to be edified, you might feel like that you're um, not totally convinced or if you want to if you want to uh, support the work by donating to some of the projects or do donating to the uh, to the platform so we can continue to do more things to disseminate the information in a higher quality. And um, if you support the work, you can donate to our cash app, dollar sign, SOTEP, uh, S-O-T, if I'm not mistaken. But we got to take the blinders off, people. So everybody in here should be well equipped. Everybody should have sword and shield when it comes to the 400 years. Everybody should have sword and shield when it comes to who's Esau. So let me get it. Let me get a Zion from everybody. Zion. Zion is one. Take the time to type that in. Zion is one. I know salt of the earth believes Zion is one. Let me get a Zion is one from uh for the almost 200 people that's in it. I see all y'all chatting it up in the chat. I know y'all know how to spell Zion is one. I'll help you. Z-I-O-N is I-S one. You can just put the number one. You ain't got to spell it out. All right, that's what all praise the most high. So Israel be blessed. I don't know if Brother Banya is chewing on some chips or, you know. I'm, I'm listening. Uh, I'm, I'm listening, bro. Something like that. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, so if you want to donate, that's what you to the donate to. It was, it was definitely a blessed Sabbath. <coughs> and until, um, let me give it about 10 seconds to see if, um, Brother Bon, you want to say anything before we uh, chime yeah. out? Can you hear me, brother? Brother Lasha, can you hear me? Put a one up if you, if, if I can be heard. All right, Israel. Put Peace a one up if, are, if I can be heard. Till next time. This is Saul of, Saul of the Earth signing out. I don't think the brother Lasha can hear me. Shalom and blessings, family. Let me end it right there.